R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 3, Chapters 23 through 27. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI Neural Voice. Chapter 23, The Crossing of the James. The cries of the wounded were fainter on the morning of June 4th, but all day long the same pitiful plea, water, water, for God's sake, water, could be heard within the Confederate lines. No attack was made that day over the ground covered by these agonized men, but no request came from the Union side for a truce to succor them. Lee, of course, dispatched no flag, because virtually none of the casualties in front of his trenches had been among his own men. It was June 5 when Grant sent any message, and then he merely proposed that each army be privileged to put out relief parties when no action was on. Lee had to say, in answer to this unusual proposal, that it would lead to misunderstanding and difficulty, and that when either army desired to remove the victims of battle, it should follow the normal procedure and ask for a suspension of hostilities. It will always afford me pleasure, he said, to comply with such a request as far as circumstances will permit. Grant could not bring himself to make this tacit admission of defeat until late in the afternoon of the 6th. The subsequent slow exchange of official communications through the lines delayed the execution of the truce until the evening of June 7. By that time all except the ambulant wounded had died or had been removed at night by comrades. The period of this correspondence and the five days that followed the burial of the Union dead, eight days altogether, were marked by no general action. The skirmishing, however, was constant and several minor attacks were delivered by Lee, only to be halted before they reached the formidable Union positions. On the 6th Early prepared a second sweep down the Federal lines from the Confederate left to the right, but found it impossible to progress through the trench system of the enemy. The Northerners, for their part, remained on the defensive. Some of the Confederates took this to mean that the Union High Command had at last seen the futility of frontal assaults. Grant, said General Pendleton, has been so shaken in the nerves of his army, if not in his own, that apparently he must get some rest. Lee held a more cautious view, because of other operations undertaken by the enemy. On June 7, most of Sheridan's Cavalry Corps started for a raid up the Virginia Central Railroad. Lee at once detached Hampton and Fitz Lee with 4,700 troopers in pursuit, leaving with the army only Rooney Lee's small division and Gary's mounted brigade of the Richmond Garrison, a very serious division of force. It was an inevitable countermove, but it was to prove most costly. Lee observed that Sheridan started about the same time that Siegel's successor, Major General David Hunter, began moving up the Shenandoah Valley. Lee assumed that these two advances were connected, and he reasoned that Grant might be waiting on the outcome, rather than halting because of exhaustion. Lee did not, however, adopt the assault tactics his antagonist seemingly had abandoned temporarily. General Matt W. Ransom's brigade had been sent over from the Bermuda Hundred Front to strengthen the Department of Richmond and indirectly had made good the losses at Cold Harbor. As long as Grant remained north of the Chickahominy, the Confederate front was quite secure. But the front of action was so restricted, the Federal commander was guarding all the approaches so closely, and the Confederate cavalry was so reduced that Lee did not think he could drive Grant out except by an assault on the Federal fortifications, and this he was anxious to avoid if possible. As the armies watched each other, neither willing to take the offensive, Lee had his first opportunity of fixing the status of the officers who had been named to succeed those who had fallen between the wilderness and Cold Harbor. Under the new law permitting appointments with temporary rank, Anderson was promoted lieutenant general and Early was elevated to the same grade. Ewell, naturally, was displeased at being supplanted and made formal application to return to duty, but Lee did not think he could stand the hardships of active service and slated him to take charge of the Department of Richmond. Major General Robert Ransom, whom Ewell was to succeed, when able to do so, was sent to head the cavalry in western Virginia. His troops were placed under Custis Lee until Ewell could take charge. In this way, Custis at last had opportunity of active combat, with his father near enough at hand to guide him. Mahone was given temporary rank as Major General to direct Anderson's division, and Ramser was awarded the same honor with Early's division.
Kershaw was formally designated as successor to McClaws in the First Corps, and a number of new brigadiers were named, some with permanent and some with temporary rank. Lee was acutely conscious of the shortage of good material, but careful, as always, to select the best men available. While these officers were adjusting themselves to their duties in the trenches around Cold Harbor, the men were dodging the Union sharpshooters and were enjoying what was to them the sumptuous fare of fat Nassau bacon and onions, with the luxury of sugar and coffee. Their spirits rose with their rations. Old you, S. Grant is pretty tired of it, at least it appears so, Colonel Taylor wrote his sweetheart. We are in excellent trim, men in fine spirits and ready for a renewal of the fight whenever the signal is given. The assurance that prevailed in the army was reflected in Richmond. I have been struck very forcibly, Richard W. Corbin wrote his father in Paris, by the sense of security which seems to prevail here among all classes. Such is the unbounded confidence of the people in Lee and his noble army, that you hear them talking not only of driving the enemy but of gobbling him up. On the sectors around Cold Harbor the men saw more of their commanding general. He rode among them often, for now he could discard his carriage, and his garb was almost as simple as theirs, blue military breeches with boots, a short linen sack coat, no waistcoat or suspenders, a soft felt hat and buff gauntlets. Traveller was always faultlessly groomed, but Lee at this time usually carried neither sword, pistol, nor field glasses. Rarely was he attended by more than one orderly. Wherever he went, he always was quick to return the salutations of his veterans. To a feeble-minded soldier who greeted him with an unmilitary howdy-do, dad, he returned a kindly howdy-do, my man. There were some croakers in Richmond who said Lee had lost most of his influence with President Davis because an anti-administration congressman had proposed that he be named dictator in case constitutional government was set aside, and others maintained that at last he had met a foeman who could match his steel, even if he was not worthy of it, but his influence over his troops was undiminished. Once, during the Cold Harbor campaign, a noisy column was passing along a Hanover road, with banter and clatter, when some of the men observed Lee resting under a tree. Word was instantly passed that Moss Robert was asleep, and the men immediately became as silent as if they had been skirmishers, taking position within earshot of the enemy. Anything was a relief after the ghastly fighting of the preceding month, but nothing of the hilarity of winter quarters prevailed in those scorching trenches, under the June sun, there in the sands and swamps of Hanover. The sharpshooting was worse than it had ever been, owing to the nearness of the opposing lines. Vicious artillery fire broke out at intervals. Demonstrations were frequent. More serious, on every count, was a slow, daily shifting of the Federal line to the left in Grant's favorite maneuver. This kept Lee's army constantly on the alert, lest the Federals slip by its right flank. Simultaneously, bad news came from the Shenandoah Valley. Hunter's Column, which had begun its march when Sheridan started on his raid up the Virginia Central Railroad, was reported to be strong and aggressive. At Piedmont, above Staunton, on June 5, Hunter fell on the Confederate cavalry under Brigadier General W. E. Jones, killed him, routed his small force, and took 1,000 prisoners. The next day Hunter occupied Staunton, where the Virginia Central crossed the valley. Toward him, from Lewisburg, Brigadier General George Crook was moving along the railway, destroying it as he advanced. General Avril was following Crook with his cavalry. Rumor put the combined strength of these invaders at 20,000, a force large enough to do much mischief. Lee, anxiously consulted by the president, did not lose his strategical perspective. It is apparent, he said, that if Grant cannot be successfully resisted here we cannot hold the valley, if he is defeated it can be recovered. He thought, on the whole, however, that the southern cause would best be served by returning Breckinridge and his command to Lynchburg, whence the troops could be moved according to Hunter's line of advance. Breckinridge left on or about June 7 and reduced Lee's strength by approximately 2,100. Hill took over the lines Breckinridge vacated. Haight's division, which had been brought from the left, was moved up in immediate reserve. The situation now became complicated. Lee was satisfied that the X Corps from General Butler, as well as the 18, was in his front, and that the force opposing Beauregard was very small. Beauregard, on the other hand, was becoming more and more alarmed.
He interpreted Grant's shift to the left as designed to bring the Army of the Potomac to the James, and he was concerned over the appearance in the river of a large pontoon bridge. A movement across the James had, indeed, become such a distinct possibility that Lee had now to reckon on four threats. 1. Grant was within nine miles of Richmond and might continue his hammering. To oppose him, with part of the Confederate cavalry detached, Lee had less than 45,000 men of all arms and could use the garrison of Richmond of about 7,400. Grant's strength was assumed to be as great as at any time during the campaign, a minimum of 100,000. 2. Grant might cross the James and crush Beauregard's 7,900 men either at Bermuda 100, at Petersburg, or on both sectors. In any such operation Grant could utilize Butler's command, small, in Lee's opinion, formidable in the judgment of Beauregard. 3. Hunter might sweep the valley and then move eastward with his force, which was now estimated at 15,000 instead of 20,000. To defeat him, Breckinridge would have 9,000 when he reached the foot of the Blue Ridge, though hardly more than 5,000 of these could be counted as combat troops. Sheridan might cut the Virginia Central Railroad and join Hunter or, having devastated Midland, Virginia and having destroyed Lee's communications with the valley, might return to Grant. Sheridan's strength was unknown but was understood to be much greater than that of the 4,700 that Lee had sent after him in Hamptons and Fitz Lee's divisions. In short, with 73,000 men in four areas of action, Lee was facing 125,000 to 130,000. These were odds of which Lee was not unmindful, but in his view, nothing that could happen in western Virginia or even, for the time being, at Petersburg, was as important as inflicting a defeat on the Army of the Potomac. No diversion clouded his vision. We must destroy this army of Grant's before he gets to James River, he told Early. If he get there, it will become a siege, and then it will be a mere question of time. It was the first time he had ever hinted at such an outcome. On the afternoon of June 9, Lee received a message from General Bragg announcing that a surprise attack had been delivered that morning against Petersburg. Beauregard had sent to the beleaguered city all the troops he could spare from the Bermuda Hundred Line and said that if he were not reinforced by Lee he would have to choose between losing Petersburg and abandoning the railway between Richmond and that city. Lee did not believe that Grant had detached troops from the Army of the Potomac or that he could send a force across the James from the position he then occupied without being observed. He regarded the move against Petersburg as a reconnaissance and nothing more. Nevertheless, Lee set Matt Ransom's brigade in motion for the Confederate pontoons at Drury's Bluff and Bragg ordered Gracie's brigade to the same crossing. As it developed, neither was required immediately at Petersburg. For, when the Federals had appeared in front of the defenses of the city, the district commander, Brigadier General Henry A. Hawise, had mustered the few troops at his disposal and had manned that part of the extensive works facing the enemy. In Petersburg the toxin had been sounded and the reserves in the city, men over 45 and boys in their middle teens, had been called to defend the works that Wise could not cover. Major Fletcher H. Archer, a veteran of the Mexican War, who commanded these poorly armed civilians, had posted them judiciously and had told them they must die before they let the Unionists seize their town. A Negro band from the city had sallied out under Philip Slaughter to play inspiring airs and to give the impression that ample troops were at hand. Even the prisoners in the jail had been released at their own request to share in the city's defense and had been hastily organized as the company of penitents. On the left, facing Wise, the Federal infantry had done little more than make a demonstration, but on the right, Kautz's cavalry had attacked with vigor. The old men and the boys had beaten off one attack and had held up a second until they had been almost surrounded. Then the survivors had been compelled to retreat, but they had gained enough time for Beauregard to hurry up reinforcements. Graham's battery had gone through the town at the gallop, followed by Deering's cavalry. Before the dust from their passing had settled, Graham had been shelling the enemy. Kautz had quickly retreated, Deering had followed him up, and the battle had been over, perhaps the unique battle of the entire war. What did this attack portend? Was it merely a bold raid against Beauregard's flank, or was it the preliminary of a movement to transfer the campaign to the south side of the James? There was, as yet, no way of ascertaining the answer, but on June 11, after Beauregard transmitted a rumor that a column had crossed the river and was planning a new advance on Petersburg, Gracie's brigade was sent him as a precaution.
It was common talk in Richmond that if Beauregard was wrong that day about the appearance of Grant's troops on the south side, he would soon be right. The movement of the Army of the Potomac over the James was taken for granted by many, especially as reports continued to come in of pontoons moving up the river, presumably to afford Grant a crossing either on the lower Chickahominy or on the James. Beauregard's friends were exhorting him to tell the War Department that in his critical situation he had either to sacrifice the Bermuda Hundred Line or Petersburg, as he could not hold both. Lee, however, had to consider all the other possibilities, along with that of a general movement of Grant's army to the south side of the James. In the face of Grant's persistent efforts to bludgeon his way into Richmond, Lee could not afford to weaken his front north of the Chickahominy on the assumption that his adversary had suddenly changed his strategy and his tactics. Nor could Lee overlook the chance that Grant might shift to the south of the Chickahominy and besiege Richmond between that stream and the James, as McClellan had essayed to do in 1862. Finally, Lee had to consider the likelihood that Grant would return the troops taken from Butler and would undertake simultaneous operations up both banks of the James. Next only to the preservation of his own army, Lee's first assigned duty was to defend Richmond. That had to be put above another temporary break in communications between Richmond and Petersburg, above even the safety of so important a railroad center as Petersburg. At his disposal were only two methods of resolving the dilemma that Grant's proximity to the James presented either Lee had to attack or else he had to concentrate on his right and prepare to move after Grant as soon as his adversary marched southward from the Cold Harbor Line. Much as Lee desired to take the initiative, the first course was impracticable. To attack, Grant, here, Lee told the president, I must assault a very strong line of entrenchments and run great risk to the safety of the army. He could only prepare for the next stage of the campaign by concentrating on his right. This he did by bringing Early from the left, where he now faced abandoned works, and putting him in rear of a P. Hill. To reduce the chances that Grant could make an orderly withdrawal unobserved, Lee had, since the Battle of Cold Harbor, bombarded the Federal lines heavily about 9 p.m. every evening. Early took his new position on the 11th. The previous day General Breckinridge had arrived at Blue Ridge Tunnel, west of Charlottesville, and had telegraphed that Hunter was moving up the valley either toward Lexington or toward the mountain gaps that led to Lynchburg. General Bragg was of opinion that the valley should be cleared, Davis passed on the message to Lee without suggestion. Lee answered on the 11th that it was desirable to expel the enemy from the valley, but that this would require him to detach a corps. If it is deemed prudent, he said, to hazard the defense of Richmond. I will do so. But, he added, I think this is what the enemy would desire. A victory over General Grant would also relieve our difficulties. The next day the news was that Hunter had occupied Lexington on the 11th. He was now free to cross the Blue Ridge and, with the valley under his control, to harry Midland, Virginia and then to reinforce Grant. This was too great a risk to take. Hunter must be stopped. Without further debate on the subject, Lee promptly changed his mind. He ordered Early to break camp and to start on the morning of the 13th with his artillery and his 8,000 infantry for the Shenandoah Valley to meet Hunter. Coupled with the previous detachment of Breckinridge, this meant that Lee was losing 20% of his entire force or approximately one-fourth of his infantry at a time when his adversary was engaged in the most menacing maneuver he had thus far undertaken. Yet if the thing had to be done, Lee determined to make the most of the necessity. With good generalship, Early would have enough men to dispose of Hunter. Then Lee planned that Early should march down the Shenandoah Valley and make a new demonstration against Washington and Baltimore. This, Lee hoped, would either compel Grant to attack the Army of Northern Virginia in an effort to make Lee recall Early, or else force Grant to detach troops for the defense of the capital and thereby give Lee some prospect of a successful offensive against the reduced Army of the Potomac. By one of those coincidences that place the history of the Army of Northern Virginia among the most dramatic stories in the annals of war, Lee's skirmishers brought back the long-expected word at the very hour when the men of Early's Corps were turning their faces westward, the long trenches in front of Cold Harbor were empty, Grant was gone. Either toward the James or toward the lower stretches of the Chickahominy, the Army of the Potomac had marched away so quietly that the Confederate pickets had not observed its departure. When they advanced a mile or two beyond the old federal lines, the skirmishers still failed to find the enemy. Immediately, the order was given to take up the pursuit.
wasting no time in choosing easy routes, Lee threw both corps across the Chickahominy, struck for the Charles City Road and moved down it toward Riddell's shop, which had been just within the Federal line at the Battle of Fraser's Farm. The day was very hot and straggling was serious, but the columns were kept closed and rapid speed was made. The Confederate cavalry outposts which had been stationed at Riddell's shop were met during the march and reported that Federals, advancing up the Long Bridge Road from the direction of the Chickahominy, had driven them back. This quickened the pace of the infantry. Late in the afternoon contact with the enemy was established by Hill's Corps and he was forced steadily eastward. All the prisoners proved to be cavalrymen, though there was some suspicion that Federal infantry had been in support. Nightfall found the army extended southward from the White Oak Swamp. Hill was on the left, with his right flank near Riddell's shop, and Anderson held the right, bivouacked on the battlefield of June 30, 1862. The cavalry occupied the Willis Church Road and Malvern Hill. Lee was thus covering the approaches to Richmond between the Lower Chickahominy and the James, and at the same time had his right flank within ten miles of the pontoon bridge at Drury's Bluff, in case Grant moved across James River. The situation had changed so abruptly and might involve so great an extension of front that President Davis asked whether it might not be wise to recall early. Lee did not favor it. I do not know that the necessity for his presence today is greater than it was yesterday, he said. His troops would make us more secure here, but success in the valley, success in marching on Washington, would relieve our difficulties that at present press heavily upon us. As the exact strength of the Federal force on the Long Bridge Road was not determined when darkness ended the pursuit on the evening of the 13th, Lee intended to attack there with Hill's Corps, but on the morning of June 14th he found that before the skirmishers advanced at dawn the enemy had departed. Whither had Grant moved? In the absence of Hampton and Fitz Lee, no cavalry operations, on a large scale, could be attempted to ascertain where Grant was reconcentrating, but everywhere that Lee's scant cavalry units could operate close to the front they were sent out to uncover the enemy. In some instances, the scouting parties were so numerous that they interfered with one another. Before noon their reports began to arrive. Grant was said to have crossed Long Bridge from the north bank of the Chickahominy with nearly the whole of his army, the base at White House had been broken up, the enemy was believed to be at Harrison's Landing, captured stragglers asserted that he intended to pass over the James at that point. It was impossible, however, with certainty to ascertain the position or movements of the Federals. There were few county roads in that part of Charles City County whither Grant had moved, and those few ran in rough quadrilaterals. By maintaining strong guards at the crossroads, Grant could screen his army as effectively as if he had taken ship and vanished down the James. For the first time since the opening of the campaign Lee was out of touch with his adversary. His cavalry was too scanty to make a reconnaissance in force, and the infantry both too distant and too weak to attempt an advance. It is worthwhile to sketch the terrain to show how the land favored Grant by making complete concealment possible within the area he had blocked. Weighing all the probabilities suggested by such reports as he had, Lee wrote the president at 12.10 p.m. June 14. I think the enemy must be preparing to move south of James River. It may be General Grant's intention to place his army within the fortifications around Harrison's Landing, which I believe still stand, and where by the aid of his gunboats he could offer a strong defense. I do not think it would be advantageous to attack him in that position. He could then either refresh it or transfer it the other side of the river without our being able to molest it, unless our ironclads are stronger than his. It is reported by some of our scouts that a portion of his troops marched to the White House, and from information derived from citizens, were there embarked. I thought it probable that these might have been their discharged men. Still I apprehend that he may be sending troops up the James River with the view of getting possession of Petersburg before we can reinforce it. We ought therefore to be extremely watchful and guarded. Unless I hear something satisfactory by evening, I shall move Hoke's division back to the vicinity of the pontoon bridge across James River in order that he may cross if necessary. The rest of the army can follow should circumstances require it. Lee had received intelligence of Forrest's success at Bryce's Crossroads, Mississippi, on June 10, and the still more welcome news that Hampton had met Sheridan at Trevilian Station, near Gordonsville, on June 1112, had defeated him handsomely and had removed the threat of a junction between Hunter and Sheridan.
This was most substantial relief and evidence to Lee's believing eyes that the South was not forsaken by a gracious providence. He added, We have only to do our whole duty and everything will be well. Within three hours after this letter was written information accumulated that Grant was on the James and that part of his forces were at Wilcox's Landing, below Westover, where the stream was narrow. Lee made his contemplated disposition of Hoke and promptly explained to the president, I see no indication of Grant's attacking me on the side of the river, though of course I cannot know positively. As his facilities for crossing the river and taking possession of Petersburg are great, I have sent General Hoke with his command to a point above Drury's Bluff in easy distance of the first pontoon bridge above that place. He will execute any orders you may send to him there. The cumulative result of the successive detachments that culminated in these orders was about as follows. Effective infantry strength, June 4, 42,000. Les Breckenridge, June 7, 2,100. Total, June 8, 39,900. Less early, June 13, 8,000. Total, June 14, AM, 31,900. Less Hoke, June 14, 6,000. Total, June 14, PM, 25,900. Margin of error, 10%, 2,590. 28,490. The Richmond garrison, by the return of Gracie to Beauregard, was reduced to 6,400. Before Hoke had moved to the pontoon bridge, the Confederate cavalry had pushed onto Harrison's Landing, where it had encountered the enemy. The 1st and 3rd Corps had spent the day on substantially the line taken up on the evening of the 13th. But if Grant was going to cross the James there was no point in holding a position so far advanced. On the contrary, if the Army of Northern Virginia was to be called upon to defend both the north and the south sides of the river, it was desirable to retire closer to the Richmond defenses. The cavalry were withdrawn accordingly, and Lee was planning on the afternoon of the 14th to move the infantry nearer the Richmond entrenchments when messages from General Beauregard raised a new doubt whether Grant was actually contemplating an early crossing of the James. Beauregard announced that transports were moving upstream. Further, he quoted his scouts as saying that a pontoon train which had gone down the James several days before had returned part of the way. As it had not passed Coggins Point, which is opposite Harrison's Landing, it might have gone up the Chickahominy. A little later Beauregard telegraphed that deserters said Butler had been reinforced by the 18 and part of the X Corps, previously sent to Grant. Could it be, then, that Grant had simply used the pontoons to cross the Chickahominy, that he had returned Butler's troops, and that he was planning to operate against Richmond, between the Chickahominy and the James, while Butler resumed the offensive south of the James? The suggestion that Butler's troops were being restored to him fitted in with the reports from the White House that Lee had forwarded earlier in the day to President Davis. Grant's march down the river might simply have been undertaken to give him a more convenient base on deep water. For these reasons Lee decided not to draw back to the fortifications of Richmond on the night of the 14th. Instead, he kept his headquarters at Riddell's shop and remained with his right flank in the direction of Malvern Hill. The next morning, June 15, opened one of the most difficult periods in the history of the Army of Northern Virginia, a crisis that put Lee's military judgment to the supreme test. Very early his cavalry reported federal troopers in their front, on the road from Salem Church, and at Malvern Hill. A P. Hill wrote that the enemy was active on his front, also, but that, as late as 9 a.m., he had encountered only cavalry. The ease with which the Federals were driven back indicated that there was no great strength behind them and renewed Lee's doubts whether Grant intended to attack on the north side of the James. As that, in turn, increased the probability of an attack on Petersburg, Lee felt that he should not hold Hoke any longer at the pontoon bridge, but should send him forthwith to support Beauregard. He issued orders accordingly. Shortly after Hoke was ordered to move, Colonel Samuel B. Paul, one of Beauregard's aides, arrived at Lee's headquarters with a full statement of the strength and disposition of Beauregard's troops. Lee was busy at the time and not disposed to go fully into the papers, saying he knew Beauregard was weak, but that he would have to make the best of the force he had. When Paul insisted, Lee reviewed the situation with him. The general explained that he had already ordered Hoke to Beauregard, and expressed the belief that Beauregard was mistaken in saying he was confronted with troops from Grant's army, though it was probable he soon would be.
Those that had returned, Lee contended, were Butler's men who had been with Grant. After some discussion, Colonel Pulse stated that Beauregard believed he would be safe, both at Petersburg and at Bermuda Hundred, if all his original command were restored to him. The only troops of Beauregard's army still north of the river were the 1,800 men of Matt Ransom's brigade in the Chaffin's Bluff defenses. These were not under Lee's orders, but he promised to ask that they be returned to Beauregard, even if their place had to be taken by local defense units from Richmond. He assured Paul that if Beauregard were seriously threatened, he would send aid and, if need be, would come himself. With friendly personal messages to General Beauregard, he sent the anxious officer on his way. Almost in the tracks of Colonel Paul's departing horse, a courier arrived with dispatches from General Bragg. These covered telegrams from General Beauregard received prior to 8.45 that morning. The latest of them was probably one written at 7 a.m. This set forth that the return of Butler's forces and the arrival of Grant at Harrison's Landing rendered Beauregard's position more critical than ever. Beauregard said, if not reinforced immediately, enemy could force my lines at Bermuda Hundred Neck, capture Battery Dantzler, now nearly ready, or take Petersburg, before any troops from Lee's army or Drury's Bluff could arrive in time. He concluded, can anything be done in the matter? There was nothing in this, or in any other of the dispatches, to indicate that Beauregard thought any of Grant's troops were already on the south side of the James. Beauregard's immediate concern was over the smallness of the force with which he confronted Butler's restored army. Lee had already anticipated Beauregard's need by dispatching Hoke, and now, answering Bragg at 12.30 p.m., he urged that Ransom be returned to Beauregard. Pending further developments, he decided to keep the remainder of the army, now reduced to six divisions, on the lines it then occupied. The cavalry that had followed the enemy during the morning returned late in the afternoon and reported that all their prisoners were federal troopers. No infantry had been encountered. That probably was all the news Lee had, for, so far as the records show, he received no further advices from Richmond that day. Perhaps General Bragg reasoned that Lee had sent Hoke's division to Beauregard and was dispatching Matt Ransom after Hoke, Beauregard would have sufficient strength to meet the new movements of the enemy in front of Petersburg that he reported in a series of dispatches to Bragg during the day. Beauregard's files show no telegrams to Lee, though copies of two messages to Bragg were directed through Richmond to be forwarded to Lee. One of these telegrams, marked 1 p.m., said that Hoke would be sent to Petersburg, that Johnson's division might have to be moved there from Bermuda Hundred to support Hoke, and that another division should be dispatched to the south side. The second telegram to Bragg, 9.11 p.m., announced that the enemy had penetrated the lines at Petersburg. Johnson would be sent there to aid Hoke, Beauregard said, and Lee would have to look to the defense of Petersburg and of Bermuda Neck. The evidence is strong, though circumstantial, that these two messages had not reached Lee when he was awakened by a staff officer at 2 a.m. on the morning of June 16 and was handed this telegram, 92. Petersburg, Virginia, June 15, 1864, 11.15 p.m. General R. E. Lee. Headquarters Army of Northern Virginia. I have abandoned my lines of Bermuda Neck to concentrate all my force here, skirmishers and pickets will leave there at daylight. Cannot these lines be occupied by your troops? The safety of our communications requires it. Five thousand or six thousand men may do. G. T. Beauregard. General. That and no more. Manifestly, no soldier of Beauregard's distinction would be abandoning the Bermuda Hundred Line and concentrating on Petersburg unless the enemy was likely to capture that city. But was it Grant or Butler, and in what strength? If Lee had received copies of all the telegrams Beauregard had sent Bragg that day, he would not have been able to say whether the attacking troops were Grant's or Butler's. There had been one hint in a dispatch from Brigadier General James Deering, commander of Beauregard's cavalry, that the Nine Corps was south of the James, but, for the rest, General Beauregard had only mentioned a federal force, first estimated at four regiments of cavalry and four of infantry, and then as three brigades of infantry with cavalry support. Who, besides these, were now menacing Petersburg? Being wholly in the dark, Lee could only act on the information Beauregard gave him.
as that officer asked for 5,000 or 6,000 men to occupy a critical sector that he was about to abandon, Lee did what he had done wherever Beauregard had made a call for troops in the face of an immediate threat, he sent them. Although the act would reduce his mobile force on the north side of the James to something between 21,000 and 24,000 infantry, plus the doubtful strength of the immobile Richmond garrison, he unhesitatingly summoned Pickett's division from the vicinity of Fraser's farm and directed it to cross the river at Drury's Bluff and to occupy the lines. Anderson was instructed to proceed at once to Bermuda Hundred, in person, with the head of the column, and to take charge on the exposed front. Beauregard was requested, if he could, to keep his skirmishers in position until these reinforcements arrived. It was only a request, for in dealing with Beauregard, Lee did not exercise the power, if indeed he knew it had been given him the previous day by the President, to direct the operations of all separate commands in Virginia and North Carolina, a definite if belated recognition of the need of a unified command. One brigade of Pickett's division was speedily underway, the others were slow in taking the road. It was nearly eight o'clock when the first brigade crossed the James on the pontoon bridge, and nine, before the rest of the division was over. Anxious to see the situation for himself, and doubly anxious because his information was so scanty, Lee broke up his headquarters at Riddell's shop and followed the first troops. Shortly before 9.40 a.m., on the morning of June 16, he was south of the river. He turned aside, soon after he crossed, and knelt by the roadside, in the dust, while a minister prayed for divine guidance in the new operations he was about to undertake. Then he rode on to Drury's Bluff. This move brought him midway between his own army and Petersburg, where he could supervise operations on the Bermuda Hundred Front, but it did not put him in closer touch with Beauregard and it separated him from the cavalry on the north side of the river. He had to rely on the telegraph for communication with Beauregard and on a line of couriers to Malvern Hill and beyond. His first act on arriving was to advise Beauregard of his position and to inform him of the arrival of Pickett's division, with a request for what he needed most, intelligence as to what the enemy was doing. Before Beauregard could receive this message, one was handed Lee from Petersburg. It was filed at 9.45 and read as follows. The enemy is pressing us in heavy force. Can you not send forward the reinforcements asked for this morning and send to our assistance the division now occupying the trenches lately evacuated by Johnson's division, replacing it by another division? G. T. Beauregard Evidently Beauregard had sent earlier dispatches that had not been received, dispatches in which he had asked for reinforcements, but now he explained nothing except that he was being pressed and needed help. Not one word had yet reached Lee from him indicating or even intimating that Grant had crossed the James. For all Lee knew, the troops attacking Petersburg might be those that were known to be returning to Butler from Grant. To bring another division from the north side would be to reduce the troops there to 20 000 infantry, including the diminished Richmond garrison. Counting Pickett, the force on the south side of the James already was 19,600 infantry, with about 1,900 cavalry. In the absence of specific information as to Beauregard's situation, Lee at 10.30 a.m. could only telegraph him an answer. Your dispatch of 9.45 received. It is the first that has come to hand. I do not know the position of Grant's army and cannot strip north bank of the James. Have you not force sufficient? While Lee was waiting for an answer to this, the head of Anderson's column was moving down the Petersburg Pike. Shortly after one o'clock Lee heard from Anderson that he had encountered the enemy at a point about opposite Chester and was driving the Union skirmishers back. It is to be presumed, wrote Anderson, that he has possession of our breastworks opposite Bermuda Hundred. The commander of the First Corps went on, I have not been able to communicate with our troops near Petersburg. If I find difficulty in clearing the road, it will be impracticable for General Pickett to reach Petersburg. A new complication, this. Regardless of how badly Beauregard might need reinforcements, if the road to Petersburg was blocked, they could not be sent there speedily. More than that, as he would have to follow roundabout roads, Lee feared it would be a slow and costly business to bottle Butler again and to reopen the Petersburg Turnpike. So, without delay, Lee ordered Field's division to cross at Drury's Bluff and directed that Kershaw march his division to the north end of the pontoon bridge and await orders there.
When Field arrived, the disposition of the joint forces would be as follows, at Petersburg, Wise's brigade and Bushrod Johnson's and Hoke's divisions, with a few minor units, on the south side of the James between Drury's Bluff and the Appomattox, Pickett's and Field's divisions, on the north side, at the Pontoons, Kershaw's division, on the line from Malvern Hill to Riddell's shop, at P. Hill's three divisions, with one division and one brigade of cavalry in support, at Chaffin's Bluff, a few. Regiments of second-line infantry and some heavy artillery, at Drury's Bluff, a small battalion of marines and a few other gunners. Leaving the heavy artillery and the cavalry out of account, the comparative strength of the forces defending Richmond and those on the Drury's Bluff-Petersburg front would be, north side, 20,000 to 23,000, south side, 22,600. Beauregard's next telegram contained nothing to justify a change in these dispositions. Beauregard explained, instead, that Pickett had not reached his line at Bermuda Neck by 10.30 and that, at that hour, his pickets still held the second line, under orders to maintain it as long as practicable. Lee's information did not indicate that the pickets were still in position, and at 11.15 he telegraphed Beauregard that he feared their withdrawal had caused the loss of the line in front of Bermuda Neck. He explained Anderson's movements and his plans to repossess the lines and concluded, What line have you on your front? Have you heard of Grant's crossing James River? Soon it was three o'clock. Anderson was driving back the Federal skirmishers and was preparing to attack the second Confederate line, which had been abandoned that morning, when Lee received a reassuring answer from Beauregard, written at 12.45 p.m. Your dispatch of 10.20 received. We may have force sufficient to hold Petersburg. Pickett will probably need reinforcements on the lines of Bermuda Hundred Neck. At Drury's Bluff at 9 a.m. or later, no news of Pickett's division. Still not a word about the troops opposing Beauregard. Measurable assurance that he had sufficient strength at Petersburg and apparently more concern for Bermuda Hundred Neck than for the city which he had been asking that reinforcements be sent. It was an odd telegram, to which Lee replied with a broad hint for more specific information and with a frank statement that he himself had no positive knowledge on Grant's crossing the river. Dispatch of 1245 received. Pickett had passed this place at date of my first dispatch. I did not receive your notice of intended evacuation till 2 a.m. Troops were then at Malvern Hill, four miles from me. A.M. Glad to hear you can hold Petersburg. Hope you will drive the enemy. Have not heard of Grant's crossing James River. In answer to this message, Beauregard only stated that the Signal Corps reported the movement of 42 transports up the James in recent days. Lee had every reason to believe that the transports were returning Butler's troops from the White House, and at four o'clock he so advised Beauregard. He added now a specific inquiry on the all-important question, had Grant been seen crossing the James? In other words, was Beauregard sure that the troops opposing him had come from Grant, rather than from Butler? This time the answer was slow in coming. Down the Petersburg Pike, Anderson's troops maneuvered for the second line occupied that morning by the Federals and took the left of it without difficulty about 6 p.m. At Drury's Bluff, Lee sat down to write the president of the day's events. After telling him of the troop movements, he expressed the fear that it would be difficult and costly to recapture the first line occupied by the Federals after Beauregard had been forced to call its defenders to Petersburg. Lee then wrote, I have not learned from General Beauregard what force is opposed to him in Petersburg or received any definite account of operations there, nor have I been able to learn whether any portion of Grant's army is opposed to him. As Lee was finishing this letter, another telegram arrived from General Beauregard, but this contained only the information that he had countermanded the order for the withdrawal of his pickets from the Bermuda Hundred Line and that they had held on until 10.15 a.m., but had then been compelled to withdraw. In justice to Beauregard, who had clearly done his utmost to maintain the front until the arrival of Pickett, Lee added this information to his letter to the president. At last, at the end of the long, tense day there came a somewhat more specific telegram from Beauregard, written at 7 p.m. and reading thus. There has been some fighting today without result. Have selected a new line of defenses around city, which will be occupied tomorrow, and hope to make it stronger than the first. The only objection to it is its proximity to city. No satisfactory information yet received of Grant's crossing James River. Hancock's and Smith's Corps are however in our front.
Lee must have held that sheet a long time in his hand and must have read it again and again, some fighting, a stronger line. No satisfactory information yet received of Grant's crossing James River, nothing in that to hint of disaster or even of acute danger. Smith's corps was there, and Smith belonged to Butler's army. But Hancock's corps, of course, was of the Army of the Potomac. Was Lee to conclude that only this corps from Grant was across the James? Was the remainder of the main Federal Army still on the north side? It was a portentous question with which to close a day of doubt. Small wonder he wrote in a letter on the same 16th of June, our existence depends upon everyone's exerting themselves at this time to the utmost. The first news that reached Lee at Drury's Bluff on the morning of June 17th was altogether encouraging. At 11 o'clock the previous night Pickett's men had recaptured the first Confederate line on the left, from the Hewlett House to Clay's farm. The troops went to work at once to re-establish Battery Dantzler, where the guns and carriages which had been buried by Beauregard's orders were found uninjured. From Petersburg, Beauregard reported that he had repulsed two attacks during the night and had captured 400 prisoners, though he had not entirely regained his first position. For the time it seemed as if the situation was stabilized, with every prospect that Petersburg would be held, that the Bermuda Hundred Front would be recovered in its entirety, and that the four divisions on the north side of the James would not be needed south of the river. Lee telegraphed Beauregard his congratulations and urged him to restore his lines, not knowing to what point Beauregard had retreated or whether he was fighting at a disadvantage. Once again he inquired, Can you ascertain anything of Grant's movements? I am cut off now from all information. Ordering the immediate repair of the Richmond-Petersburg Railroad, a part of which had been broken by Butler's advance, Lee watched the operations to regain the southern end of the first line on Bermuda Hundred Neck, kept Beauregard advised of his progress, and made a personal examination of Trent's reach on the James, where the Federals had sunk a number of vessels in the hope of preventing the descent of the Confederate ironclads from Richmond. All was going well when, shortly before noon, Lee received this message from Beauregard, written at 9 a.m. Enemy has two corps in my front, with advantage of position. Impossible to recover with my means part of lines lost. Present lines entirely too long for my available forces. I will be compelled to adopt shorter lines. Could I not be sufficiently reinforced to take the offensive and thus get rid of the enemy here? Nothing positive yet known of Grant's movements. This message had to be read carefully. Written in the characteristic manner of one who is always fashioning some bold design, it did not state that reinforcements were necessary to maintain the new lines Beauregard announced that he was preparing to draw. His request was for reinforcements with which to take the offensive. He stated that he was faced by two corps and, inferentially, by only two. Nor could he affirm that any more of Grant's army was in his front than the two corps, which was one of those he had mentioned the previous evening as opposed to him. The other, of course, was the 18. Manifestly, if Beauregard had only that force against him, the rest of Grant's army either had not crossed or had not reached the Petersburg lines. Lee could only answer, until I get more definite information of Grant's movements I do not think it prudent to draw more troops to this side of the river. Presently, Beauregard telegraphed for information as to the movements of the V Corps. He suggested that it had probably gone to meet early and that the Petersburg line might be suddenly reinforced and the enemy in his front crushed. This did not look as if Beauregard were an extremis. Lee replied with such scanty facts as he had concerning the movements of the V Corps to June 14, and, as it seemed impossible to get any detailed facts from Beauregard concerning Grant's operations, he turned again to the North Bank to see if the cavalry that had been left there could find out where the V, VI, VI, and IX Corps were. Anderson by this time held all the Confederate second line and most of the first line, except for a stronghold on Clay's farm. During the early afternoon, Pickett on the left and Field on the right were made ready to assault this central position so as to restore the front as Beauregard had held it prior to the morning of the 16th. Just as the assault was about to be made, the engineers reported that a line could be drawn around that part of Clay's farm in such a fashion as to make an assault unnecessary. Orders were immediately sent to Pickett and to Field to abandon plans for attacking. These orders reached Field, but they did not arrive at Pickett's headquarters until his men were on the move. 
Not knowing that Field had been ordered to remain where he was, Pickett informed Gregg's brigade of Field's division that he would need its support on his right flank. Gregg conformed and, in doing so, gave warning to the next brigade on his right that his flank would have to be guarded. As Pickett moved up the high ground in his front, Gregg began to maneuver to cover him. Soon the men began to pour out from Field's trenches to share in the assault, and ere long, despite orders, the whole left of Field's division was sweeping forward with Pickett. The Federals made only a feeble resistance. Shortly after four o'clock, the Confederate flag was again flying along the whole of the front opposite Bermuda Neck. Lee had not witnessed the assault in person, and he thought that it had been made exclusively by Pickett's division. In admiration for the achievement he wrote Anderson a message of congratulation which is interesting not only because it is almost the only instance in which Lee displayed his sense of humor in an official dispatch of this sort, but also because it exhibits his unshaken faith in his army. The paper read. General, I take great pleasure in presenting to you my congratulations upon the conduct of the men of your corps. I believe that they will carry anything they are put against. We tried very hard to stop Pickett's men from capturing the breastworks of the enemy, but couldn't do it. I hope his loss has been small. The road to Petersburg was now out of range of the enemy, and the railway would soon be repaired. This had not been done a moment too soon. For while the men of Anderson's corps were mounting the hill on Clay's farm, Beauregard was forwarding new and alarming dispatches. The enemy, he said, that morning had carried another other weak points on his old line and was concentrating on his right center. He was collecting all available troops to resist until nightfall when he hoped to take up new lines. We greatly need reinforcements to resist such large odds against us, he concluded. The enemy must be dislodged or the city will fall. In another dispatch, which was received just prior to 4.30 p.m., Beauregard reported that a large number of troops from Grant's army crossed the James above Fort Powhatan on the 16th and that a prisoner affirmed 30,000 were on the south side marching to join those in front of Petersburg. There was nothing specific, even yet, as to what troops remained on the north side and what units had crossed to Petersburg, but Lee felt that Beauregard's situation was now serious, despite his previous assurance and talk of a counteroffensive. Lee at once ordered A. P. Hill, if he had no contrary news of the enemy, to move to Chaffin's Bluff. To Beauregard he telegraphed, have no information of Grant's crossing James River, but upon your report have ordered troops up to Chaffin's Bluff. Kershaw, about the same time, was directed to move from Chaffin's Bluff to the Bermuda Hundred Line. Lee had moved his headquarters on the forenoon of the 17th to the vicinity of the Clay House, and there, during the evening he awaited developments. Vague indications began to point to a reduction in the Federal forces on the Bermuda Hundred sector. The Confederate troops were disposed for a shift to Petersburg if that, as now seemed probable, should be the next turn of the Wheel of Fortune. Hoke was already with Beauregard, the First Corps was, or soon would be, entirely on the Bermuda Hundred front, the Third Corps was marching toward Chaffin's Bluff. If Beauregard found that the whole of Grant's army was on the south side of the James, part of the First Corps could easily be moved to Petersburg the next morning, and Hill could be sent on before the 18th was out, leaving the remainder of Anderson's troops on the Bermuda Hundred line. If, again, Grant should be contemplating a surprise attack on Richmond, Hill was still on the north bank and close enough to the outer defenses to man them against assault. The next thing from Beauregard, what a flood of them there had been during the last two days had been written at 5 p.m. and read thus. Prisoners just taken report themselves as belonging to the 2nd, 9th and 18th Corps. They state that the 5th and 6th Corps are coming on. Those from 2nd and 18th came here by transports and arrived first, others marched night and day from Gaines Mail and arrived yesterday evening. The 9th crossed at Turkey Bend where they have a pontoon bridge. They say Grant commanded on the field yesterday. All are positive they passed Grant on the road several miles from here. Until that hour, on the evening of June 17, it must be remembered that Lee had been told only that the Federal force on Beauregard's front was large, and that the 2 and 18 Corps had been identified. Now, it appeared, the whole army was there or close at hand, except for part of the X Corps, which, of course, was on the Bermuda Hundred line. Even strength of that command now seemed definitely diminished. If all this were true, a clear course of action was marked out. But was it true?
Lee had a poor opinion of the information given by prisoners and by untried scouts, and with the fate of Richmond at stake he was not prepared to trust everything to this telegraphic summary of the examination of miscellaneous prisoners by an unidentified officer. At the same time, if the information was correct, then there was every reason to expect an overwhelming assault on Petersburg as soon as the Army of the Potomac could be disposed in Beauregard's front. Lee concluded that the weight of probability was much on the side of Beauregard's information and that the greater part of Grant's army was on the south side of the river, but he did not feel himself justified in altogether abandoning the possibility of an attack on Richmond by an adversary whose command of the river made it easy for him to move swiftly large bodies of men. He did not have to wrestle much longer with his perplexities. Before 10 o'clock this message from Beauregard, written at 6.40 p.m., was handed him. The increasing number of the enemy in my front, and inadequacy of my force to defend the already much extended lines, will compel me to fall within a shorter one, which I will attempt to effect tonight. This I shall hold as long as practicable, but, without reinforcements, I may have to evacuate the city very shortly. In that event, I shall retire in the direction of Drury's Bluff, defending the crossing at Appomattox River and Swift Creek. If Beauregard was reduced to this plight and faced as long odds as his previous telegram had indicated, then some further chance had to be taken that Richmond might be captured by a surprise attack or else Petersburg would be lost. So, at 10 o'clock, Lee ordered Kershaw to march early the next morning to reinforce Beauregard in Petersburg and simultaneously he instructed A. P. Hill to continue to Chaffin's Bluff, to cross the pontoon bridge, to move to the Petersburg Pike and there to await further orders. If needed in Petersburg, he could hurry thither, if required on the north side of the James, he could return. About the time these orders were issued, Captain A. R. Chisholm of Beauregard's staff arrived at the Clay House with the first full details Lee had yet received of the battle that had been going on at Petersburg since the beginning of the Federal Offensive. The story was enough to stir Lee's martial blood, Deering's 1900 cavalry had been driven back on the morning of June 15 to the lines that had been erected in a crude half-circle on the south side of the Appomattox River, in front of Petersburg. These works were manned by three thin regiments of Wise's Fine Brigade, with 22 field guns and some heavy pieces. A few weak and scattered units of infantry supported Wise, whose total effective strength, Deering included, was 2738. Wise spread out this little force on nearly six miles of the Petersburg defenses and awaited attack. The enemy advanced from the east and skirmished briskly until seven o'clock that evening. Shortly after that hour the enemy broke through the line just south of the City Point Railroad and could undoubtedly have marched straight into Petersburg had he pressed on. As it was, he delayed long enough for Wise's absent regiment to come up. It was followed soon by Haygood's brigade, the advance of Hoax Division, sent by Lee. These troops took a position in rear of the break in the line, and, by the morning of the 16th, when all of Hoax Division had arrived, were able to present a more formidable front to the enemy. Three brigades of Bushrod Johnson's division also arrived from the Bermuda Hundred line a few hours later and gave Beauregard more confidence. During the afternoon a general assault was delivered. This gained some advantage for the Federals, though it brought them no decision. Beauregard himself was on the ground by this time and, with the assistance of Hoke and Bushrod Johnson, put up an almost flawless defense. At intervals the Confederates counterattacked as if they had abundant strength, and on nearly the whole of the line they held the Federals at bay. No attempt whatever was made by the Union troops against the extreme right of the Confederate position, which was virtually undefended. On the 17th, the Federals renewed their attacks with vigor and soon penetrated a gap in the front of Johnson's division. They did not develop this, however, and failed in every assault until nearly the hour Captain Chisholm left Petersburg. Then about sundown they smashed through the right center of Johnson's division and doubtless would have doubled up the whole of Beauregard's line but for the arrival, at that very moment and at that precise point, of Gracie's brigade, which had formed the picket line General Beauregard had left at Bermuda Hundred when he had withdrawn the rest of Bushrod Johnson's division. Gracie immediately counterattacked, closed the gap, and halted the enemy. As Chisholm was describing this to Lee, Beauregard was drawing back to a new line, well sighted but unpleasantly close to Petersburg. Chisholm's visit and Beauregard's telegram, with a hint of a possible evacuation of Petersburg, determined Lee to send Field's division after Kershaw's as a further reinforcement to Beauregard. <laughs>
The outlook brightened momentarily after this was ordered, for a later message from Beauregard told of a successful repulse of the last assaults of the enemy, but the next dispatch, dated 12.40 a.m. contained a new warning. All quiet at present. I expect renewal of attack in morning. My troops are becoming much exhausted. Without immediate and strong reinforcements, results may be unfavorable. Prisoners report Grant on the field with his whole army. Soon two other staff officers from Beauregard reached Lee's headquarters and confirmed all this. One of them, probably Major Giles B. Cook, told Lee that Beauregard said, unless reinforcements are sent before 48 hours, God Almighty alone can save Petersburg and Richmond. The language was not pleasing to Lee. He answered, simply and reverently, I hope God Almighty will. Before morning, and perhaps before these officers arrived, Lee learned that his cavalry on the north side had reached the vicinity of Wilcox's landing on the afternoon of the 17th and had gained positive information that the last of Grant's army had crossed over to the south of the James on a pontoon bridge at that point. By 3.30 a.m. on June 18, the situation was clear for the first time since the enemy had disappeared on the morning of June 13. Lee proceeded at once to shift the remainder of his force to the new front. The undamaged part of the Richmond-Petersburg Railroad was utilized to expedite the troop movement. P. Hill was instructed to continue the march of his corps to Petersburg, leaving one division north of the Appomattox, in case it might be recalled to defend Richmond. Rooney Lee was ordered to Petersburg with one brigade of his cavalry, while the other remained north of the James. General Early was acquainted with the situation and was told to strike the enemy and return to Petersburg as soon as practicable, or else to carry out the original plan and make a diversion toward the Potomac. Finally, Lee himself broke up headquarters at the Clay House and rode swiftly after Anderson's troops toward Petersburg. At 7.30 that morning, as the exhausted troops of Beauregard's command put aside their spades and took up their muskets on the new line they had constructed during the night, they saw the glint of the bayonets of Kershaw's division coming through a ravine near Blanford Cemetery, and it was to their weary eyes the fairest sight of the entire war. Field's division arrived at 9.30 a.m., Hill's divisions were spread out on the Petersburg Pike, fighting dust and thirst and marching at a furious pace. When they arrived, which would not be before night, they were to take position on the extreme right and were to extend the front well beyond the railroad that led from Petersburg to Weldon. Lee reached Petersburg about 11 o'clock and rode out at once to join Beauregard. Together, they went over the line that had been drawn the previous night. It was so close to Petersburg that when the enemy organized his front the city could be bombarded. Otherwise, Lee had no fault to find with it. Colonel D. B. Harris, Beauregard's brilliant chief engineer, had excelled himself in selecting the best available ground when he had scarcely a moment to spare. Beauregard was so elated at the safe withdrawal to this line, and so reassured by the arrival of Kershaw and Field, that he proposed an instant attack against the enemy's flank. Lee immediately rejected the idea, in the conviction that the troops were much too exhausted for combat. It was no day to waste troops in futile counterattacks. It was, instead, a time to watch every move, to consider every step, and to conserve every life. For the great and bloody campaign from the Rapidan to Petersburg had now ended in something closely akin to what Lee had most desired to avoid. He could not have forgotten, that June morning, what he had told early, if Grant reached James River, it will become a siege, and then it will be a mere question of time. With communications still open and the troops on the north side of the James well outside the Richmond defenses, it was not yet a siege, but that, too, was only a question of time. Chapter 24, Rapidan to Petersburg in Review The burdens that Lee took up at Petersburg on June 18 occupied him daily. Except for brief visits to Richmond, he was rarely away from the sound of the firing. Visitors' horses were always at his hitching post. Mountains of military papers had to be reviewed. Each morning brought so much of anxiety that the evening found him weary. The crowded present gave him little time to think of the past. Yet there must have been rare hours when he could look back on the bloody wrestle from the Rapidan to Petersburg and would ask himself whether anything that he might have done, or might have left undone, after May 4, could have saved his army from the ordeal of the long and ghastly siege. Students of military history have been raising the same question ever since and have reviewed the campaign from many angles.
Rarely, however, has it been considered adequately for what it fundamentally was, on the one side an example of the costliness but ultimate success of the methods of attrition when unflinchingly applied by a superior force, and, on the other side, an even more impressive lesson in what resourcefulness, sound logistics, and careful fortification can accomplish in making prolonged resistance possible, even on a limited field of maneuver, by an army that faces oppressive odds. Lee's object from the hour Grant started his columns down the Rapidan was clear, he would seek to catch his adversary on the march and to destroy him, or, if that was impossible, to keep him from reaching Richmond. The capital must be saved, and that meant it must be saved from siege. In seeking to attain his object, Lee was as heavily handicapped as a general well could be, his numbers were scarcely more than half those of his opponent, he had no prospect of any large reinforcements, his artillery was inferior in weight of metal and in range to that of the enemy, the mounts of his cavalry could not endure hard service and could not be replaced when worn out. Because of casualties and illness during the campaign, he had to change the commanders of two of his three corps and the senior officers of more than a third of his brigades, for eleven of the most critical of the forty-five days of the campaign he was himself almost incapacitated, he was once cut off from his base of supplies, lost his reserve food supplies, and, during the early stages of the campaign, had to subsist his men and feed his horses on rations that barely sustained life. At the very crisis of Grant's offensive, Lee was compelled to detach two brigades and then an entire corps. Save for a major disaster in the field, virtually everything happened to him that could operate to prevent the fulfillment of his mission. When the campaign opened, half of Longstreet's infantry and most of his artillery were distant about 20 miles, a long day's march, from the south bank of the Rapidan, where the army was in contact with the enemy. Lee has been criticized for thus disposing the First Corps. The argument is that this prevented his throwing the whole strength of his army against Grant as soon as he encountered him in the wilderness. Manifestly, it would have been better if Longstreet had been with Lee on the afternoon of May 5. It must be remembered, however, that Longstreet was being held on the Virginia Central as a reserve, to be employed either with the Army of Northern Virginia or against an enemy that might attack Richmond from the east or south. Further, Gordonsville was Lee's intermediate base and was a railroad junction of great importance, connected both with Lynchburg and with the Shenandoah Valley. There was as much probability that Grant would march straight for Gordonsville as there was that he would move by his left flank and cross the Rapidan and the lower fords. Such an advance on Gordonsville was seriously considered by Grant. If it had been undertaken, or even if formidable demonstration had been made against the town, Lee would properly have been subject to criticism to exposing Gordonsville and the railroad. When it was certain that Grant intended to cross the Rapidan in the vicinity of Germana Ford, Lee decided not to dispute his passage of the river but to wait until the Army of the Potomac was spread out in the wilderness. This undoubtedly was the course of wisdom. Grant's artillery was almost useless in the Battle of May 5-6, and his cavalry could do little. That his great superiority of numbers was offset by Lee's maneuver is shown by the fact that in the first day's fighting, Lee with less than five divisions forced Grant to stop and give battle, when it was to Grant's advantage to hurry out of the wilderness and into open country. The delay cost Grant 17,666 casualties, or at least 10,000 more than Lee sustained. It is true that if Longstreet had been in line on the afternoon of the 5th, Grant would have lost still more heavily and might have been forced back across the Rapidan. But a complete concentration, in all the circumstances, was beyond Lee's power. As it was, Grant lost more men in the wilderness than Hooker did in 1863. Had casualties been the only measure of success, the Battle of the Wilderness would have been a greater victory than Chancellorsville. Lee's handling of his army in the wilderness involved four debatable acts. First of all, during the afternoon of the 5th and until about midday of the 6th, he fought one battle on the plank road while Ewell fought another on the turnpike. The two were not correlated. A gap of nearly a mile remained between the right of Ewell and the left of Hill. This was, of course, a dangerous situation, though the nature of the ground on Grant's center made it somewhat less serious than it would appear to be on the map. Lee had to take chances in concentrating along the main highways because the wilderness was almost impenetrable. Lee undoubtedly made a mistake in not withdrawing or fortifying the line of the Third Corps during the night of May 5 when Wilcox's and Haight's men lay on a broken irregular line in the wilderness, having the foe, so to say, within bayonet thrust. 
To be sure, the two divisions were exhausted, and Lee had every reason to assume that Longstreet would arrive before daylight on the 6th and would relieve Hill, but the fact remains that by this, the second debatable act in his conduct of the battle, he left tired troops in a most exposed position under commanders who were not of the first class. Haight and Wilcox could easily be surprised and might be demoralized, and if they were, then the enemy might readily turn both flanks of the Third Corps. Such incaution on Lee's part can only be explained on the ground of compassion for the weary soldiers of Haight and Wilcox. But if Longstreet had been even an hour later in coming up, compassion might have entailed slaughter. Beyond doubt, in the third place, Lee lost an opportunity because he was unaware earlier on May 6 that Grant's right was in the air between Germanaford and the Turnpike. Gordon's fine attack was delivered so late that it could not be fully developed. For this, however, the fault rests on Ewell rather than on the commanding general. On the morning of the 6th, Lee had his hands full until Longstreet delivered his attack. He might then have started for the Confederate left, though Longstreet and Hill worked so poorly together that his presence on the right was most desirable at a time when coordinated advance by the two corps seemed to hold out the promise of a victory. Even if Lee had galloped off to Ewell's front, he would have been recalled immediately by the news that Longstreet had been wounded. He was compelled to entrust the left to Ewell until late afternoon. Had Jackson been in Ewell's place, one can imagine how quickly he would have investigated Gordon's report that the flank of the enemy was exposed. Instead of doing this, Ewell deferred to the opinion of Early, who insisted that the federal right was not in the air because it should not have been. The other act of Lee's in the wilderness that has been criticized adversely was his failure to continue the flank movement immediately after Longstreet was wounded. On this point, his critic was Longstreet, who naturally wished to put his last great service to the Confederacy in its brightest light. Field's statement of actual combat conditions is a sufficient answer to Longstreet. With that wing of the army already forming a right angle, the advantage had been pushed to the limit at the moment Longstreet fell. The course Lee took in straightening out his front before resuming the attack doubtless saved the Federals from some casualties, but it probably saved the Confederates from still more. If Lee had continued to advance up the plank road while another column was parallel to it, flank fire of the sort that brought Longstreet from his saddle would have killed many men. From the Confederate point of view, the whole of the Battle of the Wilderness presented a succession of dangers and difficulties. If they were met by Lee in such a manner as to leave no just ground for criticism except for his failure to fortify or to withdraw from the line of Haight and Wilcox on the night of the 5th, then the result manifestly is a credit to Lee's generalship. But that is not all. When an army that is numerically to its enemy as 6 to 10 is able to inflict losses that are in the ratio of 14 to 7, then a question is raised as to the skill with which the larger army is handled. Especially is this the case if most of the fighting occurs outside field fortifications. Once again it must be said that it is beyond the function of a biographer of Lee to criticize the skill of his opponents. But in reaching a fair appraisal of Lee's place as a soldier, the shortcomings of his adversaries must sometimes be taken into account. In this instance, the student of war is apt to ask himself, how is it that Grant exposed his right as he did on the 6th of May? With so large an army at his disposal, why did he not more adequately cover his left flank south of the plank road? One of three conclusions seems inevitable, General Grant was less skillful in this battle than his previous achievements would have led one to expect, or he was carelessly contemptuous of Lee, or else he relied on his great superiority in numbers to the neglect of the finer qualities of leadership. The transfer of the First Corps from the wilderness to Spotsylvania on the night of May 7-8, to anticipate Grant's move to that point, has always been regarded as one of Lee's most brilliant achievements. Colonel Taylor cited the order for this march as an evidence that Lee possessed the faculty of discovering, as if by intuition, the intention and purpose of his opponent. The quality of fathoming his antagonist's next move Lee undoubtedly displayed many times, but it came from close observation, from careful analysis of his intelligence reports, and from clear reasoning on the general strategy, not from some vague intuition. On May 7, the evidence of a move was cumulative from early morning when it was found that Grant's communications with Germanaford had been abandoned. In piecing all his information together and in deciding that Grant was making for Spotsylvania, Lee did no more than he had done on a dozen occasions. The act was spectacular because the results were.
he deserves as much credit for the speed with which he ordered Ewell to follow Anderson as for his decision to send the First Corps to Spotsylvania. A close study of his logistics on May 7-8 will show them to have been flawless. Lee's dispositions after he reached Spotsylvania are interesting to soldiers in two particulars. First, as Henderson has pointed out, he most admirably adapted his position to the troops at his command. The student of war who is interested in economy of force can hardly find a better field exercise than to go to Spotsylvania and try to locate, in the face of an imaginary enemy, a stronger line, except for the mule shoe, than Lee drew. At Spotsylvania, as fully as anywhere else, the modern soldier will appreciate the point of the tribute paid to Lee by General R. L. T. Beale of the Cavalry when he said that a penciled order given him by Lee showed a familiarity with the topography of the country extending not only to byroads but even to paths. Thanks largely to the activities of Captain A. H. Campbell of the topographical engineers, Lee then had better maps of some parts of Virginia than had previously been available to him, but for Spotsylvania he had only a poor sketch that showed none of the elevations. He must have relied heavily on quick field observation and must have employed the aptitude for collecting data that he had developed long before in Mexico. He was repaid in 1864 and, indeed, throughout the war, for the long hours he had spent in questioning natives and in tracing roads at General Scott's instance. The ground around Spotsylvania Courthouse is interesting to the soldier, again, because field fortification was there fully developed for the first time in America. Thrown on the defensive with a smaller force, Lee sought to protect his men and to increase the effectiveness of their fire by giving them the full benefit of temporary earthworks. What had been done at Fredericksburg after the Battle of December 13, 1862, on the left in the initial stage of the Chancellorsville campaign, in the forest along Mine Run, and in the wilderness was done more elaborately across the fields and through the woods around Spotsylvania. The field fortifications used in this campaign were often started on piled-up fence rails or felled trees and were raised with great rapidity. When the works were constructed under fire, the dirt was always thrown up toward the enemy so that what would be the ditch in more recent warfare was the defending position. Similar defenses, constructed at leisure, had the ditch in front. The infantry works were coordinated most carefully with those for the artillery. On occasion, as at the mule shoe, prior to May 12, light ordnance was placed in advance of the infantry fortifications and, where the ground permitted, it sometimes was located immediately in rear of the trenches. There is a sector at Cold Harbor where the infantry were almost directly under the muzzles of the guns. It is impossible to say how much of the credit for these field fortifications belongs to Lee and how much to General M. L. Smith of the Engineers. There was a marked improvement in fortification after General Smith joined the army, but this may have been due to the changed nature of operations and not to the initiative of General Smith, who had learned much and had made many innovations at Vicksburg. Turning to the details of the battles around Spotsylvania Courthouse, it must be written down that Haight's battle south of the pond May 10th was not well fought and that Ewell's advance on the 19th was not well planned. Lee's own shortcomings during this period of the campaign were confined to two things, his acquiescences in the inclusion of the mule shoe in the Confederate line, and his withdrawal, during the night of May 1112, of Johnson's artillery from that salient. In permitting the occupation of this bad position, Lee was over-influenced by Ewell. He, in turn, was probably led to exaggerate the elevation of the salient by the height of the great trees in it. As operations after May 12 showed very plainly, the ground around the McCool House did not dominate the line as much as Ewell thought it did. Nothing material would have been lost if the salient had never been taken up. Lee's decision to withdraw Johnson's batteries from the mule shoe was a plain instance of his being misled by inaccurate reports of a new movement on the part of the enemy. The case is the more personal if, as seems likely, those reports emanated from Rooney Lee, who was usually careful and undeniably capable. The circumstances have, of course, to be taken into account. Grant had remained but three days in the wilderness. It was reasonable to assume that he would not waste time by lingering at Spotsylvania after he found Lee entrenched across his front. When the scouts affirmed that the enemy was again on the march, the intelligence fitted in with the probability. If the spies were right, then it was important that the pursuit should not be delayed by the slow withdrawal of the artillery along the narrow roads in the woods. But the scouts were wrong, and the responsibility for accepting erroneous reports falls on Lee.
It cannot even be established, though it is probable, that he was uninformed during the night of suspicious activities in front of Johnson's position. If he was not advised of this, the blame is still in some sense his. He should have seen to it that he was notified of all developments, for at that time nothing was more important to headquarters than to know what Grant was doing. Of course, the extreme inclemency of the weather and the uncertainty that usually prevails when wind and rain distort every sound in the darkness are factors clearly to be weighed, but they do not absolve Lee of a mistake of judgment. At Spotsylvania, as in the wilderness, Lee was materially helped by the methods his antagonist applied. Grant did not hold literally to his boast, I never maneuver. He did maneuver, but he did not maneuver well. It is difficult to say how large a success he might have attained if, during the night or at dawn, instead of in the afternoon, he had moved Hancock to the south side of the pub opposite Anderson's right flank. Lee had taken pains to draw his front in such a way as to permit the quick shifting of his troops from one flank to the other. Hancock might not have been able to shake Lee if he had continued to operate on the right bank of the river, but his effort was certainly made with the minimum of skillful direction from general headquarters. It is likewise difficult to understand why Grant did not operate against Lee's right flank, which was not extended far to the south of Spotsylvania for several days after both armies were in position. To be sure, the ground on that sector was not altogether favorable, but if the pertinacity shown in fighting for the bloody angle had been displayed on the Confederate right, Lee might have been compelled to fall back on the Louisa Road. That would have been a serious matter, as Grant might then have been able to seize Hanover Junction. The chief criticism that must be made of the federal operations at Spotsylvania, however, is the manner in which Grant on May 12 continued to hurl troops into the bloody angle until the captured position was so crowded with men that they got in one another's way. If the front of attack had been extended farther southward, to engage the Third Corps at a time when there was every reason to assume that Lee would weaken other parts of his line in order to reinforce the bloody angle, the Confederate commander might have been hard-pressed to resist. Of course, Grant had to throw enough force behind the surprise attack to make it effective, but when it is remembered that he outnumbered Lee almost two to one, the situation on the flank of the Nine Corps, as uncovered by Lane's reconnaissance, seems scarcely believable. The transfer of the Army of Northern Virginia from Spotsylvania Courthouse to the North Anna was in some respects an even finer military performance than the move from the wilderness that halted Grant at Spotsylvania. Within six hours after Grant began his march toward Bowling Green, Lee was shifting the left wing of his army to the right. Then followed the careful sweeping of the lines in front of Early and Anderson, and then the rapid, orderly retirement to the North Anna. Lee's reasons for taking that position have been given in full and need not be repeated here, but they involved more than placing the Army of Northern Virginia once more between Grant and Richmond. By moving to the North Anna, and then fortifying so strongly that his opponent did not even attack him there, Lee deflected to the eastward the line of Grant's advance on Richmond. As has already been pointed out, that was strategically of the greatest consequence, because it meant that the Virginia Central Railroad remained in Confederate hands. Communications with Staunton could be reopened. Cooperation between Grant and Siegel's successor was rendered more difficult. A drive against the Federals in the valley was facilitated, and the roads for a new invasion of Maryland were restored to the Confederacy. The grand strategy of Grant's advance, to be sure, was based on the sound principle that his mission was to destroy Lee's army, not to capture or to hold any given point, but that mission could have been more readily and quickly performed if he had placed within his lines the most direct route to the Shenandoah Valley. He could then have made himself master of all western Virginia and would have deprived Lee of large supplies. As it was, Grant cut the railroad, but during the whole of the operations on the North Anna and on the Totopotomoy, he was almost within sound of the whistles of the trains on the Virginia Central and was powerless to hold the streaks of rust that bound Richmond and the valley together. It is not too much to repeat that Lee's arrival at the North Anna ahead of Grant prolonged the war by saving a large part of Virginia to the Confederacy for another six months. On the North Anna the only offensive operation that the Army of Northern Virginia could undertake, that of Wilcox north of Noel's station on the afternoon of the 23d, was undeniably a failure. Hill's handling of the Confederate left, in fact, was at that time far from brilliant. But Lee's choice of the V-front made his left as impregnable as the right. Concerning this line, the only criticism ever made was that the position was so strong as to discourage Grant from attacking it, a singular tribute, surely, to Lee's engineering. 
Confederate authorities have often said that if Lee had not been stricken ill on the North Anna he would have defeated Grant there. This view is hardly justified by the facts. Lee's insistent cry from his tent, we must strike them a blow, doubtless echoed his well-established purpose to take the offensive whenever and wherever he found an opening, but even if he had been in full strength, it is doubtful if he could have accomplished anything on the North Anna once the Federals had crossed to the right bank and had fortified there. Had he attacked on his left, he would have found that Warren had ample room for maneuver. The result might have been to carry the battle up the Central Railroad, which was not desirable, for reasons already given. If, again, Lee had attacked from his right on the North Anna, he would soon have come under artillery fire from the left bank and would have been stopped before he could win a decision, just as Jackson had been at Fredericksburg on the afternoon of December 13, 1862. Lee's position, in short, was defensively ideal, but it could only serve to force Grant to another movement by his left flank. When that movement was made on May 27, Lee was promptly informed. He had suspected such a maneuver and had his cavalry disposed far and the Pamunkey to warn him of any advance in that direction. This employment of his cavalry was a part of Lee's defensive routine. Whenever he was guarding a river line, in a position that could be turned, he always spread his cavalry for a great distance on either flank, twice as far, probably, as most generals would have thought necessary. Being quickly advised of the appearance of the enemy at Hanover Town, Lee encountered no difficulty in making the move from the North Anna to the Totopotomoy. He was then in familiar country, for which he had a new and excellent map, and he placed his army where he could meet an attack either from the Pamunkey or down the Central Railroad. Nothing of great moment happened until Grant made his shift to Cold Harbor. Whether this was better than a drive for the Central Railroad need not be argued here. Both lines of approach offered advantages. Once Grant had started for Cold Harbor, Lee's task was to reach that point in sufficient strength to thwart Grant's turning movement and, if possible, to double up his left. The only question that arises here is whether Lee concentrated at Cold Harbor on June 1st as heavily as he should have. It is to be noted, in answer to this, that Lee's projected line, as of June 1st, extended from the vicinity of Atlee's, thence to the right, in front of the Totopotomoy, on across the old church road and southeast to Cold Harbor, a distance of nine miles. To defend this line, he had not more than 46,000 men, including Hoke's division, which was just arriving from the south side of the James. This gave Lee a density of only 5,000 infantry a mile, whereas his opponent, who had the initiative, could dispose 10,000 men per mile. Lee had more than 10,000 infantry and about 2,000 cavalry within striking distance of Cold Harbor by the early morning of June 1. That was all he could do, and he could not have done that much if he had not insisted on the dispatch of Hoke from Beauregard. The actions at Cold Harbor on June 1 were poorly directed on the Confederate side. The fiasco in the early morning was a discredit both to Anderson and to Hoke. The surprise in the afternoon at the ravine between Hoke and Kershaw may have been excusable. Throughout the day, the hand of a master was lacking. Anderson was a new corps commander, Hoke was inexperienced at the head of a division, the shock troops were led by a gallant amateur in the bitter business of war. At no time during the campaign did Lee feel more heavily the losses he had sustained among his general officers in the wilderness and at Spotsylvania. Grant may have owed his escape from a serious defeat that day to the recklessness with which Longstreet and others had exposed themselves during the fighting in May. From the time Lee himself arrived on the Cold Harbor front the battle was well ordered. He anchored his right on the high ground above the Chickahominy and located his support lines opposite the weakest points in his front. Then he simply waited. When Grant attacked, the Union lines were mowed down with a slaughter worse than that inflicted on Pickett and Pettigrew at Gettysburg. Grant later went on record as saying that he always regretted making the last assault. At Cold Harbor, he wrote, no advantage whatever was gained to compensate for the heavy loss we sustained. The repulse, in his opinion, impaired the morale of his army and raised that of the Confederates. He undoubtedly was correct. The prospect, however, was not so forbidding on June 3 as it seemed in retrospect. He was within nine miles of Richmond, as the crow flies. For a month he had been hammering away at an adversary who could not continue to replace his losses, whereas the Army of the Potomac could draw indefinitely on resources that were, in comparison, almost limitless.
Besides, the strength of the Confederate position was deceptive. On that part of the front where the Federal losses were heaviest the approaches were through woods. In rear of the Confederate lines, the ground was open, with no trees, to give a measure of the elevation. Grant apparently thought, as most historians since his day have assumed, that the whole of the ground of attack was a plain. On the right center, this was true only of the front immediately on either side of the Cold Harbor Road. To right and to left, the little streams flow through boggy ravines that offer some exceedingly formidable artillery positions from which a crossfire can be directed on an attacking force. It is not remarkable that Grant was deceived as to the strength of Lee's lines or that he was repulsed. It would have been remarkable if he had broken through. The success of Grant in crossing the James unhindered and the failure of Lee to reinforce Petersburg more quickly and more heavily after the attack of June 15 have been very generally regarded as the most serious blemishes on Lee's military record, with the possible exception of his order for Pickett's charge at Gettysburg. There was disappointment at the time in Richmond because Grant was not assailed while in motion. Later critics have had much praise for General Grant because they have credited him with keeping Lee in the dark as to his position and plans until the Army of the Potomac was in front of Petersburg. General Humphreys cited Lee's dispatch of 3 p.m., June 16, to Beauregard. Have not heard of Grant's crossing the James, as if the whole shift to the south side of the James had been unsuspected, and he added, at that hour only the Six Corps and Wilson's cavalry remained on the north bank. Colonel Thomas L. Livermore went so far as to affirm, not only was the movement so orderly, silent, and well covered that the enemy did not attack, but the strategy also was so complete that from the 13th, when it began, until the 17th, General Lee did not venture to quit his entrenchments at Cold Harbor. In summarizing the operation General Alexander wrote, it must be said that Grant successfully deceived Lee as to his whereabouts for at least three days, and thus, at the most critical period of the war, saved himself from a second defeat, more bloody, more signal, and more undeniable than Cold Harbor. For if Beauregard alone, with only 14,000 men, was able to stop Grant's whole army even after being driven by surprise into temporary works, what would Lee and Beauregard together have done from the strong original lines of Petersburg? It is easy, of course, to point out the errors in these criticisms, but, prima facie, the basis of this contention appears valid. Grant began ferrying his army over the James on June 14. He soon completed a superb pontoon bridge from Wilcox's Landing to Windmill Point. Bringing the 18 Corps by water back from White House to Bermuda 100, by daylight of June 15 he had 45,000 to 47,000 on the south side of the James. That force was hourly increased. With the exception of a part of the Cavalry Corps, the whole of the Federal Army, some 110,000 to 113,000, was south of the river before Lee was sure that any part of it, other than the 2 and 18 Corps, was there. This looks as if Lee, for once, was outgeneraled. Much evidence, however, that was not available when these early critics wrote of the campaign has since been published, 21, and this reverses the verdict. Instead of appearing as the most serious instance during the war when Lee was outwitted, the operations of June 1418 constitute a most informative example of how a limited force may be defensively employed to defend two widely separated positions when a stronger adversary is so placed that he can move unobserved, as must occasionally happen even in modern warfare, though a commander can now utilize aerial observation. The evidence on the issue has been given in detail in the previous chapter, without breaking the narrative to analyze it in relation to the larger question of Lee's generalship as compared with Grant's. It must now be reviewed briefly in the light of the conditions that confronted Lee. These conditions were 1. In a country as heavily wooded as that below Richmond, Grant, or any other competent general, could steal one march on his opponent. 2. Lee was weakened by the absence of two of the three divisions of his cavalry, which he had been compelled to send off in order to meet Sheridan's raid up the Central Railroad. This was one of the many prices Lee had to pay for declining manpower and diminished horse supply. His cavalry, which once had been greatly superior to his adversaries, was now inferior in every respect other than in actual hand-to-hand -hand combat. 3. Lee's mobile infantry and artillery, as distinguished from the small force of second-line reservists and heavy artillery in the Richmond defenses, had been reduced by the departure of Breckinridge and of Early to less than 32,000. These detachments were most regrettable, but in a strategical sense they were inevitable.
If troops had to be sent to the Shenandoah Valley, it was wise to dispatch them in sufficient numbers to make a demonstration against Washington. The hard subtraction of these troops, however, made it impossible for Lee to take the offensive against the Army of the Potomac which, exclusive of cavalry, numbered at least 93,000 and perhaps more. For, Lee's first assigned duty was to keep Grant from Richmond. The permanent severance of communications with the South would, of course, involve the fall of the city in a very short time, but if the choice lay between the loss of Richmond and the risk of a temporary break in communications, Lee could not hesitate in deciding to defend his capital. It is debatable whether the Confederate administration was right in insisting that Richmond be held at any price, but there can be no disputing the fact that in the summer of 1864 this was the fixed policy of the government. Lee was forced to subordinate everything to that or else should have resigned his commission. These were the controlling circumstances with Lee when Grant withdrew from the Cold Harbor Front and moved by rapid, well-executed marches to Wilcox's Landing. In doing this, the Union commander put 22 miles of road between himself and Lee. Grant's choice of a place for throwing his pontoons was, perhaps, his best single stroke of the entire campaign. A special pains were taken to select a point on the river beyond observation by Lee, as it was assumed that the Confederate leader would use his inner lines and would reinforce Beauregard quickly if Grant attempted to construct a bridge at a nearer and more convenient point, such as the flats below Malvern Hill. Lee could not reach Grant at Wilcox's landing. He could not prevent the return of the 18 Corps from the White House by water. Nor could he stop the transportation of the advanced units of the two corps by ship from Wilcox's Landing to Windmill Point. Three facts, however, are now definitely established, and they cancel most of what has been written about this aspect of the movement. 1. Lee expected Grant to cross the James. 2. He knew the approximate position of his adversary by the early afternoon of June 14. 3. He had ordered Hoke's division to the Confederate pontoon bridge at Drury's Bluff eight hours before Grant's bridge at Wilcox's Landing was finished. Lee was ready, in short, to begin the reinforcement of Beauregard before Grant had done more than utilize his available transports to strengthen Butler's army. When new troops began to appear in front of Petersburg on June 15, Lee naturally was forced to rely on Beauregard for information as to their number and identification. Unfortunately, many of the reports that he received from Beauregard were belated, vague, and well-nigh equivocal. This was not altogether Beauregard's fault. That officer had set up what he considered an efficient signal system on the James, but he had no spies and his intelligence service was so rudimentary that even the examination of prisoners seems to have been delayed. He was preoccupied with the defense of a long line and was unable to determine whether the troops that assailed the Petersburg defenses were Butler's or Grant's. However excusable all this was, it proved a handicap to Lee. The first concern expressed by Beauregard was that he might not be able to hold both Drury's Bluff and Petersburg. Then he stated that if he had the whole of his original command he would be safe on both sectors. Lee promptly restored it. Beauregard next voiced the opinion that if 5,000 or 6,000 men were sent to the south side, they would suffice to cover Bermuda Neck while he reconcentrated at Petersburg. Lee forthwith sent Pickett's division of 4,500 men and rode with it himself to the Petersburg Pike, where Butler had seized Beauregard's abandoned lines. On the afternoon of that same day, June 16, Lee brought over Field's division. Beauregard was an experienced officer whose rank and judgment were to be respected. He was presumably the best judge of his needs. Not one request for men did he make with which Lee did not comply, from the time of the first threat until Beauregard, becoming optimistic, asked for reinforcements to undertake a counteroffensive that the judgment of Lee did not approve. All this is a most material consideration in determining whether Lee did everything that could have been expected of him. The substance of all Lee's information from Beauregard on the 16th and during the forenoon of the 17th of June was that he was confronted at Petersburg by the 2 and 18 Corps. In answer to repeated inquiries whether more troops of the Army of the Potomac were south of the James, Beauregard could make no positive answer. Lee knew that these two corps, plus the other forces under Butler, could not exceed 51,000 to 53,000 men. To combat them, 27,000 Confederates were then on that bank of the river. The odds against the Confederates there were no longer than those to which Lee was accustomed during the whole of the campaign.
he had, in fact, already sent more reinforcements to Beauregard than he had made available for Ewell when that officer had been holding the base of the bloody angle against the concentrated attack of three corps. It was after 4 p.m. on the afternoon of June 17 when Lee was told by Beauregard for the first time that he was faced by practically the whole of the Army of the Potomac as well as by part of Butler's Army of the James. Within 12 hours thereafter, Lee had on the south side, or on the march thither, all his mobile troops except Hampton's cavalry and two battalions of artillery under Colonel Thomas H. Carter. The table on page 444 will exhibit the strength of the opposing forces north and south of James River from June 13 to the morning of June 18. In the last column is Beauregard's estimate of the strength of the enemy in his front. Included are all the cavalry. Approximate forces north and south of James River. June 1318, 1864. 000 omitted. North side, south side Beauregard's estimate of the federal strength on the south side. June 13, 44.7 to 47.6, 104 to 111, 11.315 to 17. June 14, evening. 44.7 to 47.6, 74 to 81, 11.3, 45 to 47, 25 to 27. June 15, morning, 36.9 to 39.8, 74 to 81, 19.1, 45 to 47. Large increase, c. 11 a.m. June 15, evening. 36.9 to 39.8. 68 to 74. 19.1. 51 to 53. June 16, morning. 36.9 to 39.8. 56 to 62. 19.1. 63 to 65. June 16, evening. 28.9 to 31.8. 31 to 37. 27.1. 88 to 90. 7 p.m., 51 to 53. June 17, morning. 28.9 to 31.8. 25 to 31. 27.1. 94 to 96. 11.15 a.m., intimating Vicor was not in his front. June 17, evening. 24.9 to 27.8. 7.5. 31.1. 111 to 113. For 30 p.m., 81 to 83. June 18, morning. 9.8, 7.5, 47.2 51.1, 111-113, 5.00 p.m., whole army. Beauregard's troops made a splendid fight in front of Petersburg and were handled by him with great skill and boldness. Nobody could have done better, favored though he was by some curious delays and by a most singular division of authority among the federal commanders. He was aided, too, by good initial positions and by a strong force of well-employed artillery. It must be said, however, and in no derogation of his generalship, that the excellence of Beauregard's battle grew as the story was told. Especially after Colonel Roman began the preparation of his military biography of Beauregard, the repulse of the federal attacks on June 1517 was glorified into something akin to a rescue of Lee from certain ruin by his comrade on the south side of the James. This view was generally credited by the participants because many of the troops that shared in the actions had not, until that time, been acquainted with the close and desperate combat by which the Army of Northern Virginia sustained itself in the field. A soldier's first hard battle is usually his worst, in memory, at least. On the other hand, Lee, his staff, and his veterans were so accustomed to fighting against long odds that they took them as a matter of course. Lee did Beauregard the compliment of assuming that his men could fight equally well and against like odds.
a commander who had seen Cook at Sharpsburg, Jackson at 2nd Manassas, Barksdale at Fredericksburg, Pickett at Gettysburg, and the 2nd Corps at the Bloody Angle could hardly become so excited over the attacks on Petersburg that he would risk the capture of Richmond, strip the north bank of the James, and increase a force of 27,000 in order to resist an attack by a force that Beauregard put down at two corps. Lee had heard the cry of Wolf Wolf so often from the south side during May that he may have been a little skeptical of Beauregard's reports. No special concern did he have for the safety of Petersburg until Beauregard acquainted him on the afternoon of June 17 with the newly discovered fact that the whole of the Army of the Potomac was confronting him. This is the record. It speaks for itself. Lee unavoidably lost contact with Grant on June 1314, but he did not misread the intention of his adversary. He reasoned that Grant would cross the James, precisely as he had reasoned that McClellan would reinforce Pope, Burnside move to Fredericksburg, and Grant reconcentrate on Spotsylvania. He was not outgeneraled nor taken by surprise. If he did not reinforce Beauregard heavily at Petersburg until the strength of the attacking force became known, he gave Beauregard in every instance the help that General asked for defense, though his own forces were then dangerously small. He had to be guided by Beauregard's information, which was limited and slowly accumulated, but he sent enough troops to Petersburg to hold it, without neglecting his major mission, that of ensuring the safety of Richmond. To summarize now the entire campaign from May 4 to June 18, the only three serious shortcomings that can be charged against Lee would seem to be, first, that he did not withdraw Haight and Wilcox or strengthen their lines on the night of May 5, second, that he ordered Johnson's artillery from the mule shoe at Spotsylvania during the evening of May 11, and, third, that he lost contact with Grant on June 1314, in the absence of the greater part of his cavalry, and risked the capture of. Petersburg until Beauregard got accurate information as to the presence of Grant's army in front of that city. Against these three errors, if they are to be so considered, may be set down his sound decision to give battle in the wilderness, the swift move to Spotsylvania, the selection of an admirable line there, the shift to the North Anna, the deflection of Grant's advance on Hanover Junction by the construction of an excellent system of field fortifications, the transfer of operations to the Totopotomoy, the concentration at Cold Harbor, the repulse of Grant's general assault there, the relief of. Petersburg, and, as a final gauge of the ferocity of the Confederate defense, the infliction of approximately 64,000 casualties, with a loss of about 30,000 men. The Federals lost more men before the guns of Lee's army, with the stout assistance of Beauregard's troops on June 1518, than Lee had in the Army of Northern Virginia when the campaign opened. The balance of achievement, then, is to Lee's credit, overwhelmingly. So far as general strategy and headquarters tactics could influence the result, his generalship had never been finer, if, indeed, it had ever been quite so good. Wherever Grant advanced, there he found Lee's bayonets closing the road to Richmond. Yet even before the crossing of the James, time and numbers were having their effect. Lee did not lose the battles, but he did not win the campaign. He delayed the fulfillment of Grant's mission, but he could not discharge his own. Lee found few opportunities of attacking the enemy in detail or on the march, and in every instance where he assumed the defensive, except in the turning movement of May 6, he failed to achieve the results for which he had hoped. This was not because the Army of Northern Virginia fought less well than before, but because the Army of the Potomac was relatively stronger and fought better. Lee's miserable never behaved with greater gallantry than in the wilderness on May 5 and in recovering the bloody angle on May 12, but their numbers were smaller, and in some subtle fashion General Grant infused into his well-seasoned troops a confidence they had never previously possessed. There was, likewise, an ominous decline in the standard of Confederate Corps, Divisional, and Brigade Command. Too many of the ablest officers had been killed and were replaced by soldiers less skillful. After Longstreet was wounded, every corps commander failed badly, at least once. Two excellent new divisional commanders were developed in Kershaw and Gordon. Ramser and Mahone showed promise. But some of the others did not fulfill expectations, and a few more were definitely mediocre. The same thing was true of the brigade commanders. There was no remedy for it and there could be no blame on Lee because of this, but the somber fact remained, troops were no longer led as they had been in the period from 2nd Manassas through Chancellorsville. In the largest sense, only Lee and the men in the ranks still made the army terrible in battle. Chapter 25, Lee's Most Difficult Defensive
When General Lee went to church in Petersburg on June 19, 1864, the day after he reached the city, the military problem and the solution of which he sought divine guidance was as grave as any he had ever faced. The front of battle was now 26 miles in length, from the cavalry outposts at White Oak Swamp to Chaffin's Bluff, thence on the south side of the James from Drury's Bluff past Bermuda Hundred Neck to the Appomattox, and over that stream, southward and westward in front of Petersburg, to a point beyond the Jerusalem Plank Road. The whole of this line had at all times to be held. Lee was required, in the second place, to prevent the enemy from seizing ground that would force the Confederate army back into the Richmond defenses, thirdly, he had to cover the capital against surprise attack at any point not protected by his lines, and fourthly, he had to keep open the railroads, on which he was dependent for supplies. In performing this task, for what guidance could he hope? Early might be able to change the gloomy outlook. Lee was satisfied that officer could drive back Hunter, and, indeed, on the second day at Petersburg, he received news that Hunter had retired from in front of Lynchburg. Perhaps, as Lee had planned ere he detached him, Early could advance down the Shenandoah Valley, spread terror in the north, and thereby force General Grant either to detach a large part of his army for the defense of Washington, or else to attack Lee in the hope of compelling him to recall Early. Again, by some miracle, a great victory might be won in the far south that would release troops from that section to reinforce the Army of Northern Virginia, but a miracle it would have to be, because Johnston had fallen back from Dalton to Kennesaw Mountain and was as hard beset by Sherman's hammering tactics as Lee had been by Grant's. For the rest, Lee had to rely on his own army and Beauregard's, plus such conscripts as might be brought in and such convalescents as might return. Valiant as his army was, the limits to its possible accomplishments were manifest. Although there was abundant reason for believing that the Federals were dispirited after the severe repulses they had sustained, Lee's own force had been so reduced by casualties and detachments that he had small chance of undertaking a sustained offensive unless Grant should be guilty of some serious blunder and present an opening. General Grant, he told the President, will concentrate all the troops here he can raise, from every section of the United States. I hope your excellency will put no reliance in what I can do individually, for I feel that will be very little. The enemy has a strong position and is able to deal us more injury than from any other point he has ever taken. Still we must try and defeat him. I fear he will not attack us but advance by regular approaches. He is so situated that I cannot attack him. Lee believed, however, that he could defend Richmond from a direct assault delivered on the north side, provided he could keep the Richmond-Petersburg Railroad in running order for the transfer of troops in an emergency. The one advantage of the Confederate commander was this, Grant had approached Petersburg from the east. His lines ran north and south and had not yet been extended to the southwest or to the west. Lee's own lines, on the Confederate left, paralleled Grant's, but as Lee had to protect Petersburg fully, he drew his lines north and south and then to the west. On the sector east of Petersburg, little distance separated the trench systems that sweating thousands were now throwing up under the June sun, but from the point where Lee's line curved to the westward, while Grant's continued southward, the space between the two fronts widened gradually until it became as much as two miles. The extreme Confederate right, which was lightly held, quite overlapped the Federal front there. This situation gave Lee a certain freedom of maneuver on his right. He availed himself of this very promptly and employed his right division as a general reserve to strengthen the sector to the east, as occasion required, or to be moved across the James and aid Custis Lee in defending Richmond. The question of subsistence was more serious than the prospect of being pinned to the Richmond-Petersburg defenses. Lee was almost entirely dependent on the railways to feed his army. These roads were four in number. Close to the Richmond defenses lay the long-contested Virginia Central. Directly south from Petersburg ran the Petersburg and Weldon Railroad, which was a link in the main coastal route leading to Wilmington and Charleston and thence to Atlanta. Southwestward from Richmond was the track of the Richmond and Danville. This was connected at Danville with the new Piedmont Railroad, leading to Greensboro, and C. General Lee, it will be recalled, had been very anxious to have the Piedmont completed, in anticipation of a possible loss of the Petersburg and Weldon. Now that the Piedmont was at last open, though wretchedly constructed, it gave Richmond a second, if a slow and devious, connection with the rich corn belt of northwestern Georgia.
Besides these lines, Lee had to defend the Southside Railroad, which led by way of Lynchburg to Bristol on the Virginia-Tennessee border. This railroad was of no mean importance because it crossed at Buckville the track of the Richmond and Danville. Supplies arriving by way of Greensboro and Danville and intended for the army could be transferred to the Southside Road at Buckville and could be sent immediately to Petersburg. This will be plain from the sketch shown above. Surveying these lines of communication, Lee was satisfied that it would be almost impossible to hold permanently the Petersburg and Weldon, the northern end of which was less than three miles from the left flank of the Federals. His aim was to keep the enemy from that railway, if possible, until the harvest in Virginia, or as long as he could do so without heavy loss. Meantime, he urged that the South Side, the Richmond and Danville, and the Piedmont be supplied with ample rolling stock and defended by the Second Line Reserves, so that these lines could supply the army when the Petersburg and Weldon fell into the enemy's hands. If this cannot be done, he told the Secretary of War, in as plain words as he had ever employed, I see no way of averting the terrible disaster that will ensue. He soon had evidence that the dangers to the railroads were as immediate as they were serious. On the 21st of June outposts reported an extension of the federal lines toward the Weldon track simultaneously, the Union cavalry was found to have started on a raid farther down the same road. The only large mounted unit that Lee then had on the south side of the James was Rooney Lee's division, for Hampton was still watching Sheridan north of the river. Rooney's troops, who had skirmished with the enemy on the 21st, were sent in pursuit of the raiders. Wilcox's division was moved out to take the place of the cavalry, but it found the enemy's infantry retiring. The next day, when Lee rode to the Confederate right, he learned from Mahone that the Federal infantry was again advancing. Mahone thought he saw an opening for a flank attack and asked permission to deliver it. With Lee's approval, he led off three brigades from the Confederate right, found that a gap had been carelessly left between the two and six corps, and quickly rolled up two strong Federal divisions. He skillfully drew back before nightfall with more than 1,600 prisoners, for guns and eight flags. Still more might have been accomplished had Wilcox cooperated with Mahone, but as Wilcox's orders from Hill were contrary to Mahone's plan, Wilcox held to his instructions and did little. Encouraged by the evident low morale of the Federal infantry in this engagement, Lee at once projected an offensive against the Federal right near the Appomattox. As most of the participating troops belonged to Beauregard, that commander prepared the plan of operations. A heavy force of artillery was placed at Hancock's Hill, on the north side of the Appomattox, and was directed to open on the morning of the 24th. Hoke's division was then to advance and was to storm the Federal line. Field was to follow, and the two were to sweep down the Union works. On the designated day, Lee rode out to the hill and joined Beauregard to witness the action. It opened brilliantly but ended abruptly when the advance of Haygood's brigade of Hoke's division was not supported. Hoke apparently thought that Field did not execute his part of the operation, but Lee was of opinion that Field could not have moved forward until Hoke had cleared the lines. There seems to have been some misunderstanding, he said, as to the part each division was expected to have performed, and he dropped both the move and all criticism of it. This fiasco of the 24th offset the success of the 22d. The net advantage of current operations depended on the outcome of the cavalry raid undertaken by the Federals simultaneously with the advance of their infantry on the 21st Union horse reached the Weldon Railroad at Reams Station, some eight miles south of Petersburg, tore up several miles of track there, and then started out in two columns, one to destroy the line of the south side in the vicinity of Black and Whites and the other to wreck the junction at Buckville. Rooney Lee followed the former column and soon engaged it. His father was provoked that Hampton had lingered so long on the north side of the James and seemingly to so little purpose in dealing with Sheridan. On the 25th, he sent the South Carolinian a rather sharp call for reinforcements. On the previous day, however, Hampton had redeemed himself by a handsome victory over Gregg at Nance's shop and speedily sent part of his command to the Petersburg sector. Pending its arrival, Lee followed anxiously the news of the raiders. Those who had moved to the Southside Railroad were driven from Black and Whites, after doing some damage there, and then were hurried off to join the other column, which was destroying the Richmond and Danville. The joint force then made for the bridge across the Staunton River, in the hope of burning the span, but it was repulsed valiantly on June 25 by a handful of reserves under Captain L. B. Farenholt, a young soldier whose whole military career had been one gallant adventure.
On the 27th, Lee's information was that the column was returning to the federal lines by a southerly route chosen to bring the Federals back to the Weldon Railroad in the vicinity of Stony Creek, where further wreck might be wrought. When General M. C. Butler reached Lee's headquarters that day, bringing cavalry reinforcements from the north side, the commanding general received him with flattering attention, in part, perhaps, to atone for his criticism of Hampton on the 25th. As he so often did when he wished to show his appreciation of a visitor's service, he offered him some delicacy that had been sent him. I only wish, he said, that I had enough to divide with your gallant soldiers who have distinguished themselves so nobly. With Butler at hand and the rest of Hampton's command coming up, Lee swiftly set a trap for the railroad wreckers. Butler was to place himself between the returning Federals and the Weldon Railroad. Hampton was to join him there. Mahone was moved out of the Petersburg lines and was advanced to Reams Station. Fitz Lee was to support him at that point with his division of cavalry as soon as it arrived from the north side. The plan worked out perfectly. Butler and the rest of Hampton's division formed a junction with Rooney Lee. Together they drove the enemy on the 28th and headed him for Reams Station, which the federal commander thought was in Union hands. When the weary Federals approached that place on the 29th, Hampton pressed their rear, Mahone met them in front, and Fitz Lee struck their flank. The result was an utter rout, involving heavy Federal casualties, 1,000 prisoners, 13 guns, the wagon train and all the loot and Negroes that had been seized on the raid. This brilliant action gratified the army, and, though Lee did not know it, their heavy losses led the Federals to conclude that they no longer had a numerical superiority in cavalry. There was much jest in Confederate camps when Mahone's returning infantry and the tired cavalrymen told of the speed with which the retreating Federal commander, who proved to be Brigadier General James H. Wilson, had hastened back to the security of the Union lines. The favorite gag was that Wilson had eagerly torn up the roads to break Lee's communications, and then, with like alacrity, had torn down the roads to escape his pursuers. To Lee, however, the fact that Wilson had destroyed parts of two railways meant more than that he had scattered the dust of the country byways in returning to the federal camps. There was a bad break on the south side and a much worse one on the Richmond and Danville Railway that could not be repaired for weeks. Lee redoubled his efforts to strengthen his cavalry and to guard these lines of communication. Meantime he hauled supplies around the gaps and pushed the work of replacing the ruined rails. Writing to the president during the progress of the raid, he reaffirmed his belief that the shortage of supplies was his most serious concern and hinted that this might compel him to attack Grant in his fortified position, dangerous as that would be. As continuous hot, dry weather forced a virtual suspension of large-scale operations toward the end of June, while the men labored to strengthen the lines, the only cheer in the army was over the good news of Early's advance down the Shenandoah Valley. Hunter had retreated westward and not northward as Lee had feared, but as there was at least a possibility that Hunter might return, Lee reasoned that Early's best method of dealing with that invader would be to march for the Potomac. When Early approached New Market and seemed to have a clear road to Harper's Ferry, Lee hoped for a time that his plan would work out, that a farther advance on Early's part might lead Grant to attack the Petersburg lines, in the hope of compelling him to recall the expedition. And if Grant could be induced to attack, another cold harbor would be awaiting him. In the respite allowed the Army of Northern Virginia by the hot weather and by the inability of the enemy to undertake a new movement, Lee made many new acquaintances and renewed old friendships in the pleasant city of Petersburg. He had established his headquarters on the lawn of Violet Bank, the home of the Shippen family, just north of the Appomattox and close to the Richmond-Petersburg Turnpike. It was a pleasant house, with an inviting rear balcony, and was set in a grove of trees. The mistress of Violet Bank was an invalid, but she was unremitting in her kindness to General Lee, as were the people of the town. They sent him many presents of food, nearly all of which he distributed in the hospitals for the comfort of the sick and wounded. From Petersburg people and from friends in Richmond came also more clothing than Lee could use. If they are not gray, he said about one lot of garments, they are of no use to me in the field. Despite the tenders of the Shippens, he kept his quarters in the old tent he had used since the West Virginia Campaign of 1861, a tent now so leaky and battered that in July he had to ask that it be replaced. From this tent he wrote to Mrs. Lee on the anniversary of their wedding day, Do you recollect what a happy day 33 years ago this was? How many hopes and pleasures it gave birth to?
God has been very merciful and kind to us, and how thankless and sinful I have been. From this tent, also, he went out into the grove on Sundays for morning worship conducted by General Pendleton or by Rev. William H. Platt, rector of St. Paul's, whose church in Petersburg was under fire and had been temporarily closed. At first the bombardment had alarmed the people of the town, but as it continued with only an occasional casualty, they became accustomed to it and went calmly about their duty and their pleasure. The weird sound of the passing shells became as familiar as the whistles of their tobacco factories. One day, near the town, Lee encountered a little girl at a gate, caring for a baby. A shell had just fallen in a nearby field, but the girl had paid no heed to it. He drew rain, whose children are these, he asked. This is Charles Campbell's daughter, said the girl, and this is General Pryor's child. Run home with General Pryor's baby, little girl, away from the shells. My love to your father. I'm coming to see him and he rode on. It is not of record whether he found opportunity of calling on Campbell, the historian, but he entered cheerfully into the social life of the place, as he always did when his headquarters remained long in one community. When he had the leisure he would often ride into town, sometimes for a meal, more often for a call, and not infrequently to condole with a family that had recently lost a son or a father in battle. Hearing that Norborn Bannister of Chelsea had been killed, he went to the fine family mansion. The funeral of the boy was in progress at the time, so Lee remained outside till the obsequies were over, and then he quietly disappeared. The next day he returned and soon was coming almost every Sabbath, on invitation, to dine and talk with the family. The usual Lord's Day fare, it is remembered, was Irish potatoes, one slice of bacon for each person, cornbread, coffee made of parched sweet potatoes, and dried apricots sweetened with sorghum, as sumptuous a meal as patriotic city folk could allow themselves in that famished year. If there was quiet on the Petersburg sector that permitted these social amenities, there were alarms and anxieties, hopes and forebodings on other fronts of the hard-beset South. General Early's name was on every tongue laid in June, and his prospects were discussed in every council and at every bivouac. He was advancing down the valley and soon would be in position to threaten Washington. Lee continued to hope that Grant would meet this thrust by taking the offensive. It is so repugnant to Grant's principles and practice to send troops from him, Lee told the president, that I had hoped before resorting to it he would have preferred attacking me. Grant's talent and strategy, he wrote Custis, consisted in accumulating overwhelming numbers. But, to his disappointment, Grant did not fulfill Lee's hope. Instead, signs multiplied that the federal commander was making detachments, and as Lee was confirmed in his belief that he could not advantageously attack Grant in positions that were now exceedingly strong, he began by July 11 to consider the dispatch of troops to strengthen early. It was a dangerous venture, perhaps it was desperate, for the Army of Northern Virginia, including Beauregard's forces, now numbered only 55,000 men of all arms. Many schemes for giving effectiveness to Early's advance were proposed. One was to organize a movement for the liberation of the prisoners at Point Lookout so that they could join Early. Lee canvassed this thoroughly and sent his son Robert as a special courier to Early to explain his part in a projected enterprise to this end. Another suggestion was to dispatch an artillery expedition against Washington. Lee deemed this scarcely practicable. Still another plan was to conceal Lee's presence at Petersburg and to create the impression that he was personally leading the army in the valley, as if it were engaged in a major offensive. Opinion varied in the army as to the outcome of Early's operations. Some were optimistic. Colonel Taylor wished that Jackson might have been in command, and was satisfied that the blessing of heaven would not be on a man as godless as Early. Beauregard was aggrieved that the leadership had not been entrusted to him. Early soon settled all doubts and vindicated Lee's confidence in him. For a time he made a continent hold its breath. By July 4 he was at Harper's Ferry, on the 6th he crossed the old battlefield of Sharpsburg, the 9th saw him on the Monocacy, where he defeated a federal force under Major General Lew Wallace, on the 11th he was within range of the forts defending Washington. His column, however, was too feeble to venture an assault, and he had to withdraw on the 14th to Virginia soil, by way of White's Ford, above Leesburg. Lee was delighted at Early's audacity and much amused at the panic his appearance created, but he was not disappointed at Early's return. 
he had not expected him to be able to capture Washington. His view of the potential results was conservative. Before Early turned back, Lee wrote the president that the expedition might serve a useful purpose in compelling the enemy to keep troops near the Potomac. He did not believe President Lincoln would willingly consent to the return to Grant of the forces sent to guard Washington, but he held no high expectations unless Early was strong enough to cross the Potomac a second time, and he anticipated that the Second Corps might be forced to return to the Upper Valley if Hunter's column was not called to Maryland. In an effort to make it sure that Hunter would be occupied on federal soil, Lee urged that Brigadier General John H. Morgan be sent on a raid into Pennsylvania, but he argued in vain for this. Early continued to demonstrate vigorously, despite his lack of support, and on July 28 he was able to announce that he had again forced the enemy across the Potomac and was himself at Kernstown. The outlook in the South became gloomy while Early's advance was raising hope in some hearts. General Johnston was maneuvered from his strong position on Kennesaw Mountain and fell back close to Atlanta. There were hints that he intended to abandon Atlanta, also, and he was most reticent in his communications with the War Department. President Davis had discovered in the winter of 1861-1862 the proclivity of General Johnston for retreating, but he was slow now to give ear to the clamor that arose from Georgia for the removal of that officer. Lee must have known that a change of commanders was being considered, but he was not prepared for a crisis when he received on July 12 the cipher telegram from the president announcing that it was necessary to remove Johnston and asking what he thought of Hood as a successor. Lee always had cherished a high opinion of Johnston, though he was quite familiar with the peculiarities of his friend, Joe. He knew little of the immediate reasons for the contemplated action of the president, but he knew the limitations of Hood, at least to the time the beloved Texan had left the Army of Northern Virginia. He accordingly wrote the chief executive this characteristic reply, which Colonel Taylor coded. Telegram of today received. I regret the fact stated. It is a bad time to relieve the commander of an army situated as that of ten. We may lose Atlanta and the army too. Hood is a bold fighter. I am doubtful as to other qualities necessary. Later in the day he wrote the president more in detail. I am distressed at the intelligence conveyed in your telegram of today. It is a grievous thing to change commander of an army situated as is that of the Tennessee. Still if necessary it ought to be done. I know nothing of the necessity. I had hoped that Johnston was strong enough to deliver battle. We must risk much to save Alabama, Mobile and communication with the Trans-Mississippi. It would be better to concentrate all the cavalry in Mississippi and Tennessee on Sherman's communications. If Johnston abandons Atlanta, I suppose he will fall back on Augusta. This loses us Mississippi and communication with Trans-Mississippi. We had better therefore hazard that communication to retain the country. Hood is a good commander, very industrious on the battlefield, careless off, and I have had no opportunity of judging of his action when the whole responsibility rested upon him. I have a high opinion of his gallantry, earnestness, and zeal. General Hardy has more experience in managing an army. May God give you wisdom to decide in this momentous matter. This was as reserved as his counsel to the administration usually was in everything that did not pertain to supplies, recruitment, and the operations of his own army. Reading between the lines, it was plain that he doubted the wisdom alike of removing Johnston and of naming Hood. His judgment of the strategy required in the South was plainly put, Johnston, he thought, should send his cavalry against Sherman's communications and accept the risks of battle. A few days after Lee expressed these views, Secretary Seddon visited him, told him that the removal of Johnston had been decided upon, and asked his advice, as Davis had, concerning a successor. There is no record of Lee's reply other than that he declined to give positive counsel and expressed his regret at the necessity felt by the administration for a change of commanders. He must have had no little misgiving when he learned on July 18 that Johnston had been ordered to turn over the army to Hood. If Hood succeeded, there was hope for the South. But if he failed, only the dwindling army of Northern Virginia stood between the Confederacy and ruin. Chapter 26, Lee Encounters a New Type of Warfare The Crater, July 30, 1864
Wearily, along lines that were now becoming very formidable earthworks, the survivors of Lee's many battles awaited the next move of their adversary. An hour before dawn every man was aroused and stood at arms to repel attack. After daylight, one man and two could sleep as best he might under the summer sun. The other fifty percent of each command had to remain constantly on the alert, weapons in hand. Half an hour before dusk the whole of each regiment mounted the fire step and remained there until dark. Then those who had slept during the day went on duty. Two men of each company were required to keep up infantry fire from dawn till night. Each fired once in five minutes, twenty shots to a regiment every ten minutes. The sharpshooters became so proficient on both sides that momentary exposure of the person was almost certain to result in a serious wound, if not in death. There was always, too, the danger of an exchange of mortar shells. The Federals had put these weapons into action at the beginning of the investment of Petersburg. The Confederates began to employ them on June 24. It was seldom that the artillerists of either army got the exact range of the trenches, but they fired steadily, sometimes furiously, and forced the men to keep under cover, especially when in rear of the works. In hot weather the heat, the flies, and the stench of the latrines made existence a torture. When a long June drought ended and thunderstorms became frequent, the water was often two feet deep in the trenches and sometimes eighteen inches on the banquette. Drainage was very slowly installed. Those who sickened under this ordeal were scarcely better off than those who contrived to stick it out, for many of the field infirmaries were for a long time in wretched condition. Often, as the weary men listened in moments of silence, they thought they heard the sound of picks at work, far underground. As early as July 1, General Alexander, who was going home for a short leave on account of a wound, reported to General Lee his conviction that the enemy was mining. Countershafts were sunk at intervals along the lines, and listening galleries were run out, but the engineers failed to encounter the federal miners. Suspicion was strongest that the enemy was striking for a position known as Elliott Salient, located one and five-eighths miles south of the Appomattox and nearly three-quarters of a mile southeast of Blandford Cemetery. This was, in reality, more of a re-entrant than a salient, and was a somewhat weak point, closer to the federal works than almost any other part of the front. In rear of it a second and part of a light third line were constructed. Perhaps the precautions against the explosion of a mine were not so thorough as they might have been, because the Confederates did not believe a tunnel could be run for the 500 feet that lay between the lines. Francis Lawler, the correspondent of the London Times, who happened to be at Lee's headquarters when Alexander reported his suspicions, maintained that 400 feet was the absolute limit of length for such a tunnel, because ventilation could not be had for a greater distance. The men in the ranks took the talk of a mine as something of a joke and told newcomers that Grant was trying to mine all the way under Petersburg so as to take the army in reverse. Already, they said, the Federals had carried their tunnel as far as Sycamore Street, the main thoroughfare of the town, and had installed a train. A conscript was assured that if he listened carefully, he could hear the roar of the engine, and if he looked he could see the smoke from it, rising through the spaces among the cobblestones of the roadway. All the signs of mining operations on the Petersburg front General Lee followed with care, but he had equal anxiety for the north side of the James River. General Ewell, who had now gone on duty, had only a small force there, consisting chiefly of the heavy artillerists at Chaffin's Bluff. In the emergency created by the movement to Petersburg, the local defense forces of the capital had been called out and had remained on the line below Richmond until the end of June. Lee also had kept two brigades of infantry at Chaffin's Bluff, though on July 4 he had to warn General Ewell that he could not count on these troops permanently. In his correspondence with Custis, the general often discussed the organization of troops for any sudden attack north of that sector. General Ewell, he reasoned, would be on the alert and could give a measure of protection on the waterfront by the use of his 20-pounder parrot guns, but Lee was convinced that he could not get early warning of any sudden advance on Richmond from the land side. His apprehension was heightened by the knowledge that General Grant enjoyed the great advantage of inner lines, for the Federals had thrown a double pontoon bridge across the James at Deep Bottom, whereas Lee's pontoons were above Chaffin's Bluff. On July 23 there were reports that Union troops had crossed to the north side. Lee thought it likely that they were intended for nothing more serious than to interrupt Confederate operations on the James, but as a precaution he ordered Kershaw's division to Chaffin's Bluff.
When he learned that the Federals were entrenching opposite Deep Bottom, Lee directed Kershaw to drive the enemy back and, if possible, to destroy the pontoon bridges. Before Kershaw could accomplish anything, Lee discovered on the morning of July 27 that the two corps had crossed the James, apparently for a surprise attack on Richmond. He at once dispatched General Anderson to Chaffin's Bluff, followed by Haight's division of the Third Corps. As these troops encountered both infantry and cavalry in considerable numbers on the 28th and had the worst of a skirmish with them, Lee ordered Rooney Lee's cavalry across, together with reserve artillery, and on the 29th he sent Field's division and Fitz Lee's cavalry. The south side was almost denuded by these transfers. Pickett was on the Bermuda Hundred Line. In front of Petersburg were only Hoax and Johnson's divisions of Beauregard's command, Mahone's division of the Third Corps and part of Wilcox's command, altogether about 18,000 infantry. To risk the very existence of this small force was to purchase security for Richmond at a heavy price. Perhaps it was at this time, when he was strained to the utmost to defend so long a line, that Lee began to doubt whether it was wise to attempt indefinitely to hold Richmond with his weakened army. Late in the night of July 2930, after reading the dispatches from the north side, Lee became satisfied that the enemy was merely making feints at other points and was preparing to attack on the Petersburg sector. At 2 a.m. on the 30th, a general warning was sent down the trenches. It found Hoke on the Confederate left, defending nearly a mile of the front southward from the Appomattox. Next to Hoke, toward the right, was Bushrod Johnson's division, from left to right, Ransom's, Elliott's, Wise's, and Colquitt's brigades. This was the part of the line on which the evidence of mining by the Federals had been strongest. Johnson's right rested at Rives Salient, about a fourth of a mile northeast of the point where the Jerusalem Plank Road passed through the line. West of Rives Salient, on the right of Johnson, where the Federal lines were at a greater distance, were Mahone's and half of Wilcox's divisions. The men of the Third Corps were veterans, of course, but the greater part of the defenses were in the keeping of Beauregard's army. This was in accordance with a decision that Lee had reached but naturally had never announced to leave the less experienced troops on the line and to employ the more seasoned units in open operations when it became necessary to draw men from the thinly held trenches. Before another twelve hours passed, Lee was to have evidence that in a crisis Beauregard's men could be as readily trusted as his own. At 4.44 on the morning of July 30th there came across the Appomattox to Violet Bank the sound of a distant but mighty explosion, somewhere to the southeast of Petersburg. Was it the mine of which there had been so much speculation, or had a great magazine been fired accidentally? Lee and his staff made ready. At 6.10 a.m. galloping officer arrived from Beauregard. On the front of Elliott's brigade, he said, the enemy had blown up the Confederate line and under cover of a wild tornado of fire had thrown forward heavy columns into the crater formed by the upheaval of hundreds of tons of earth. The Federals were already in the works and at the moment might even be advancing straight on Cemetery Hill, a sinister name, surely, in the memory of Gettysburg. Lee's orders were given almost as soon as the message was delivered. The line must be restored at once, or Petersburg would be lost. Colonel Venable was to ride forthwith to General Mahone's headquarters and was to tell him to draw two brigades out of the line, unobserved by the enemy, and to hurry them to a position in rear of the gap in the fortifications. The other staff officers were assigned instant duty. Lee himself mounted Traveller and, unattended, hurried toward the front. At Hill's headquarters he found that officer's assistant adjutant general, Colonel W. H. Palmer, who told him that Hill had ridden off, a few minutes after the explosion, to bring up Mahone. Lee said he would go in person to expedite the movement. By a short route to the left of Halifax Street and along Lieutenant Run, he hurried with Palmer toward Mahone, but before they reached the house where Mahone was lodged they found his troops underway. Lee turned at once, rode out into the open, and when he reached a point whence the break in the lines was clearly visible, he drew rein, took out his glasses and surveyed it carefully. Smoke was rising thick above it, the whole sector was aflame with bursting shell and flashing infantry fire. How many federal flags, he asked, could Palmer count on the works? The young colonel took his glasses and scrutinized the whole of the captured position. Eleven, he answered. Eleven regiments, at the least, virtually three brigades, a heavy force, not easily to be driven out.
Lee wheeled Traveler again and rode back to Mahone's column as the two brigades of Weisiger and Wright moved down Lieutenant Run. Seeing that the men of the Third Corps were pressing steadily onward, Lee hastened to General Johnson's quarters, northwest of Blandford Cemetery. Here he found General Beauregard, who had been forward to the G House, some 500 yards in rear of the crater formed by the mine. After a few words, they went on to G's and, from its upper windows, got an excellent view of the action that was now at White Fury. The explosion had occurred about the middle of Elliott's front, some 200 yards north of the Baxter Road. It had destroyed the front line for a distance of 135 feet and had left a crater some 30 feet deep, with a breadth, from front to rear, of 97 feet. Nine companies, forming part of two South Carolina regiments, had been blown up, together with the men of Pegram's four-gun battery, which was stationed between the main earthworks and the Cavalier Trench. Two of Pegram's pieces had been left intact, the others had been hurled high into the air, and one of them had landed in front of the wrecked fortification. A great clod of clay, almost as large as one of the Negro cabins around Petersburg, had been lifted from the crater and was poised on the rim nearest the enemy. As he looked over the ground, Lee could see that the enemy had crowded men into the crater by the thousand and had captured about 30 yards of the line to the right of it and some 200 yards to the left. Union flags floated also from the second line, though none of the Federals were yet over its parapet. Lee learned that Elliot's men had been demoralized by the explosion for a few minutes only. Those who had fled from the works had rallied quickly. On the left of the crater, in the ditches, and behind the traverses that led from the first line to the second, they were keeping the Federals at bay. On the right, a fragment of Elliot's brigade had the support of Wise's men, who held a sector from which they could pour a fire into the crater and across the field leading to it. These two brigades, almost unaided, had met the first onslaught and had prevented the enemy from extending his front along the trenches. To them, first of all, was due the credit for saving Petersburg. Lee thankfully observed, also, that the artillery had gone into action quickly and was pouring a blasting fire into the crater. On Wise's front, Davidson's battery had two guns in a fixed position, looking down a shallow ravine. Only one of these could bear on the enemy and this one had been abandoned for a short time by its crew, but it had been manned by Wise's troops, some of whom had been trained as artillerists, and it was now firing fast and with the deadliest precision. Apparently the Federals could not locate it, though many of their field pieces were searching for it with their shells. In rear of the left of the crater, where a hill rose above the covered way that ran from the right of Ransom's brigade, was Wright's battery of four 12-pounder Napoleons. The elevated position of this battery gave it a clear field of fire, virtually at point-blank range into the crater. When Lee turned his glasses in that direction, Wright was firing as fast as his men could serve the pieces. The enemy's shot broke about them till the very ground was pockmarked, but this seemed only to spur them to greater speed. From the Jerusalem Plank Road, almost directly in rear of the crater, Flanner's North Carolina battery was plastering the Federals in the second line, undeterred by the ceaseless fire directed against it. Some nearby mortars were sending their shells into the chasm on high, graceful arcs. The approximate position of each of these Confederate artillery units is shown in the sketch on page 473. Evidently the enemy was stopped, but for how long? With his superior artillery to cover his infantry, he might force his way up and down the trenches or dash straight forward to Cemetery Hill, which was undefended. The Federals must be driven out, it might be bloody work, but there was no way of avoiding it. Where were Mahone's two brigades? Moving up the covered way, their commander said. A third brigade had been ordered to join them. Were any other reinforcements available? None, General Johnson assured Lee, except one regiment that Hoke was sending from the left, and a few of Elliott's men, who had been placed in a sheltered ravine between the lines and the Jerusalem Plank Road. Mahone, then, must charge with what he had, and as quickly as he could file his men into the depression where the South Carolinians were waiting. Conley Lee directed his subordinates to prepare for the assault, carefully he counseled where the officer should place the 3rd Corps reserve artillery that was now arriving. The infantry fire had slackened somewhat by this time, it was now after eight, or else the ears of the combatants had been deadened to its rattle, but artillery bombardment increased in violence every moment.
From across the distant Appomattox, Captain William D. Bradford began to send shell from his 20-pounder parrots as far as south as the Hare House, in a grim warning to the enemy not to extend the front of attack. Colonel John Haskell, on the plank road, stirred his gunners to still more brilliant practice, Ellett's and Brender's pieces, under their brilliant battalion chief, Colonel William Pegram, were in battery and added their salvos to the din 14 Union flags were visible now, federal officers could be seen on the parapet of the second line, waving their swords and urging their men to come out of the ditch and charge up Cemetery Hill. How much more time would be required to get all the men out of the covered way and into the ravine? Daniel Weisiger, the senior colonel of Mahone's old Virginia brigade, was working furiously to make ready, General Mahone's aide, Captain Victor Girardi, was everywhere, Mahone himself, with encouraging words, was hurrying latecomers into place. The Georgia brigade of right, which had marched on the heels of the Virginians, was gathering on their right. At last the word was given for the men to move out of the ravine and to crouch in the open as they formed their line. Only one special instruction was given, that the troops should not fire till they were on the enemy. At the G-House, Lee knew that Mahone was forming, and he must have watched with anxious eyes as the Grey Regiment spread themselves along the ravine, but still more anxiously must he have looked to the occupied line to see if the Federals would advance before the Confederates were ready for them. Soon a Federal officer on the parapet seized a flag, called once more to his men to charge, and sprang down toward the open ground between him and the Confederates. Out from the works came his followers, their number swelling every second. Girardi saw them leaping over the parapet and cried out, General, they are coming. Tell Weisiger to move forward, said Mahone on the instant. But Weisiger had not waited for orders. He had shouted forward at the same instant that Girardi had called to Mahone, and his 800 men, with some of the Georgia troops and a fragment of Elliott's brigade, raised the old rebel yell and started up the hill. As Lee saw the valiant gray line spring up from the ground at the very instant the Federals started their charge, he must have had some of the exhilaration he had felt that day at Fredericksburg when he had told Longstreet it was well war was so terrible or they would grow too fond of it. Up the hill the line swept, its ragged battle flags, flying, with the fire of all the Confederate batteries redoubled as if in applause. Soon it was apparent that the right of the Georgia Brigade had not started with the rest. The front of attack was too short to cover all that part of the line held by the Federals. Perhaps, too, the men unconsciously oblique to the left, for when they approached the second line, their right was perhaps 100 yards to the left of the crater. No quarter, some foolish Federal cried, as they leaped into the rear work. They answered with one volley, jumped over the parapet and fought it out with bayonet and clubbed musket. Only a few minutes of this and then, their lines irregular but unbroken, they rushed for the front trench. Thrust and counterthrust there, and soon, through the smoke, the red of their flags could be seen on the main parapet. Most of the ground on the left was recovered in this charge, the gap was narrowed, Haskell's mortars were brought close up, where they could drop their shells into the crater with so light a charge of powder that the gunners had to smile, gleefully Mahone's men collected the hundreds of muskets the enemy had dropped. Now for the right. Those of the Georgia Brigade who had not assaulted with Weisiger were ordered forward to take the second line, immediately behind the crater. At 10.30 they advanced, but met so heavy a fire that they, too, drifted to the left and only reached the rear position where it was already occupied by their comrades. Still the enemy held the crater, a section of the main line on either side of it, that part of the second line just in rear of it, and some scattered rifle pits. On the left of the chasm, Mahone's and Elliott's troops steadily drove the Federals back along the front line until they were almost to the edge of the crater, and on the right Wise's brigade pushed the foe to the very rim. One more effort must be made, this time by the 3rd Brigade of Mahone's division, Saunders Alabamians, who had been summoned from the right before the first advance. Arriving at 11 o'clock, they were disposed with care. The order was that when they went forward, the other infantry commands on either side the crater, and Colquitt's brigade on the right of Johnson's division, were to cooperate with every musket and every man. Saunders' troops were told to stoop low as they went up the grade, until they reached the point where they could see the enemy. Then they were to break into the double quick and were not to halt until they reached the crater. Lee sent word to Saunders that he had no more troops available. If the Alabamians did not take the crater on the first assault, he said, he would reform them and would lead them in person. The thing had to be done and done by Saunders.
the remainder of the line had been stripped almost bare to supply troops for the counterattacks. On the front from which Mahone had been drawn, there was only one man every twenty paces. As Saunders' brigade gathered in the ravine for this grim business, a soldier covered with dirt and powder came up to Captain James C. Featherstone. Captain, he said, can I go into this charge with you? Yes, said Featherstone hurriedly. Who are you? The man gave his name, which unfortunately has been lost, and explained that he belonged to one of the South Carolina regiments that had been blown up. I want to get even with them, he said. Please take my name, and if I get killed, inform my officers of it. I have no time for writing now, Featherstone answered. How high did they blow you? I don't know, the man replied, but as I was going up I met the company commissary officer coming down, and he said, I will try to have breakfast ready by the time you get down. The spirit of this brave fellow was that of the Alabama troops whom he had joined, for the brigade had been Wilcox's, and among its 628 survivors were some who had distinguished themselves in their most renowned battle, that of Salem Church. They were ready now. It was one o'clock. On the second, the order forward went down the line, and the men began to creep out from the ravine and up the hill. The artillery roared anew, the shells screamed over their heads like frightened birds. Soon all were in the open, where the enemy's fire began to tell on their ranks. But this time there was no obliquing. Directly up the incline they went, straight for the crater. Lee watched them, now hidden in smoke, now visible, and saw them reach the second line, from which the enemy had fled. They waited there only long enough to catch their breath and were about to dash into the crater when, at one point, a white flag was raised and the Federals surrendered. At another place on the crater rim, the fighting kept up. By direction of Colonel J. H. King, some of the Alabama troops lifted their caps on their ramrods just over the rim of the crater. A hundred bullets tore them to tatters, and the volley that was meant for the men was wasted. Immediately the Alabamians sprang into the crater, followed by soldiers from the other brigades of the division. The melee was like a battle of despairing demons. One captain fell dead with eleven bayonet thrusts. The sight of Negro troops, whom they now encountered in close action for the first time, seemed to throw Mahone's men into a frenzy. Bewildered by the onslaught, all the Federals who could do so fell back into a smaller pit, in front of which the explosion had raised an earthen barrier. The Confederates were preparing to follow them there, when there were wild cries, shouts, uplifted hands, frantic appeals, and a final surrender. Meantime, thousands of the Federals had scurried across the open ground toward their abatis, preferring the chance of falling before Confederate bullets to the certainty of long confinement in southern prisons. The Battle of the Crater was over. As quickly as it could be done, an earthwork was run around the edge of the pit and the line was restored. At 3.25, Lee was able to report to the War Department, we have retaken the salient and driven the enemy back to his lines with loss. Mahone counted 1101 prisoners and Johnson's division had a lesser quota. Twenty flags were taken. The price paid by the Confederates was about 1,500, of whom 278 lost their lives or were captured when the mine exploded. Lee was much gratified that so serious a threat had been repulsed with such unequal losses, and he said of the action, every man in it has today made himself a hero. He at once had Mahone regularly promoted to command of the division he had been temporarily heading, and he raised both Colonel Weisiger and Captain Girardi to the rank of Brigadier General. The camps rejoiced and told incredible tales of what had happened, but the full horror of the struggle in that inferno of man's own making was not apparent until August 1, when many of the Confederates entered the crater during a truce declared at the request of General Meade. The sight, wrote Colonel Taylor, was gruesome indeed. The force of the explosion had carried earth, guns, accoutrements and men some distance skyward, the whole coming down in an inextricable mass, portions of the bodies of the poor victims were to be seen protruding from immense blocks of earth. The bottom of the pit was covered with dead, white and black intermingled, a horrible sight. Chapter 27 The Loss of the Weldon Railroad Bloody as had been the repulsive grant at the crater, Lee expected him to continue mining and he pressed the work of driving countershafts. While watching this, he learned on August 4 that General Grant was moving troops down James River.
I fear, Lee wrote the president, that this force is intended to operate against General Early and when added to that already opposed to him, may be more than he can manage. Their object may be to drive him out of the valley and complete the devastation they had commenced when they were ejected from it. The Confederate commander realized Grant had so entrenched himself that he could now send off troops to dispose of Early and still hold his lines. Lee felt that he could release only two divisions, at most, and in doing that would not have a single unit outside the trenches. But he concluded that if it were Grant's intention to overwhelm Early, it would be better to detach troops than to risk the loss of Early's little army and of the Virginia Central Railroad. Once Lee reached a decision to send reinforcements to any point, he considered that promptness was half of advantage, so, on August 6, he went to Richmond and held a conference with President Davis and General Anderson. The conclusion reached at this council was to dispatch Kershaw's division of infantry and Fitz Lee's cavalry to northern Virginia under General Anderson. The plan was that Anderson should not join early at once, but should take position in Culpeper, where he could menace the flank and rear of the Federals in case they advanced up the valley against Early. The troops moved the same day, and when reports multiplied of further detachments from Grant, though Lee was not persuaded that the reports were true as to infantry, he prepared to send to Anderson the rest of the Cavalry Corps, except Rooney Lee's division. His hope was that Anderson might employ the troopers north of the Potomac or east of the Blue Ridge and prevent too heavy a concentration against Early. Had Lee been able to carry out this plan the course of the war might have been affected by it, for Sheridan might not then have been free to throw his whole strength against Early. On August 11, Lee went across Bermuda Neck, by this time known in the Army as the Howlett Line, in order to observe the Federal activities at Dutch Gap. General Butler was reported to be digging a canal at that point, an operation Lee sought to interrupt, because, if it succeeded, the enemy might turn the left of the Howlett line. Again on the 13th General Lee visited that sector to observe the artillery fire. The next day, August 14, the enemy attacked with vigor on the north side of James River. Major General Charles W. Field was in actual command there, though General Ewell headed the department. Field's division of the 1st Corps and the Chaffin's Bluff garrison occupied an advanced line that ran from the bluff to New Market Heights and thence past Fussell's Mill to the Charles City Road. This line, however, was so long that from the mill to the Charles City Road the works were merely patrolled by Gary's small brigade of cavalry. The Federals seized the works near Fussell's Mill early on the 14th, but were met by two regiments of dismounted cavalry, and when Field brought up a brigade of infantry, the enemy was flanked and forced to retire. The news of this reached General Lee at Violet Bank as he was preparing to start for church. With Kershaw gone and all the cavalry except Rooney Lee's division and Deering's brigade on the way to northern Virginia, Lee of course had no troops to spare. His judgment told him that the federal move might be a feint, but after assurance from Field that it was serious, he ordered two brigades of infantry from the Petersburg front. At the same time, and doubtless with the deepest regret, he directed Hampton to abandon his march to join Anderson and to hurry back to assist Field. Once again, the initiative enjoyed by the numerically superior enemy upset Lee's strategy. Going to Chaffin's Bluff in person on the morning of August 15, Lee found that except for some cavalry fighting on the Confederate left the Federals had not renewed the action that day, though they were manifestly very numerous and were fortifying. The enemy's delay gave Lee time to bring up the troops that had been ordered from the south side, together with a scratch brigade from Pickett's division. The infantry were extended somewhat to the left of Fussell's Mill, and Rooney Lee's cavalry took position on the Charles City Road. The situation was then about as shown on page 483. While in the vicinity of Chaffin's Bluff, during the forenoon of the 16th, Lee heard from Field that the Federal cavalry had driven Rooney Lee's pickets from White Oak Swamp and were moving in force up the Charles City Road toward White's Tavern. This was ominous news, for Field's line ran at a wide angle to the Richmond defenses, and the Federals were thus already in rear of his left and on a direct road to Richmond. Lee at once sent a message to President Davis that the local defense troops be called out to man the outer line around the city, and he prepared to take Field's left brigades and to throw them against the flank of the force on the Charles City Road. For that purpose, Lee rode along the advanced line, toward Field's position near Fussell's Mill. But before he could reach that point, and long before the toxin was sounded in Richmond, the enemy had approached within 50 yards of the light Confederate works, to the left of the mill. Then, with a rush and a cheer, the Federals charged.
Two southern brigades broke, and a gap was torn in Field's front. The situation is shown on page 484. But most of Field's men were tested veterans of many a battle. At the call of their commander, they shifted to the left and opposed a line to the Federals, who, fortunately, did not realize the magnitude of their advantage. Then, in a quick counterattack, Field's division pushed the Union troops back and speedily recovered the works. A little later, on the Charles City Road, more by chance than by fine logistics, the Van of Hampton's returning division arrived to support Rooney Lee. Together these troopers ran the enemy across White Oak Swamp. The crisis ended as quickly as it had arisen. In the midst of the pursuit of the Federals, while Lee was giving orders to hurrying staff and couriers, a characteristic incident occurred. One of a group of prisoners came boldly up to him and complained that a Confederate private had taken from him a soldier's most prized possession, his hat. Lee at once suspended what he was doing, had the Federal point out the man, saw that the hat was returned, and then, without even a shadow of annoyance at the interruption, turned back to his task as if the recovery of captive's headgear were part of his daily duty. I wondered at him taking any notice of a prisoner in the midst of battle, wrote another Union soldier who was captured that day. It showed what a heart he had for them. As the enemy did not renew the battle on August 17, Lee prepared a cavalry operation for the 18th to clear his left flank along the Charles City Road. This was measurably successful, but before it was fully developed, Beauregard telegraphed that a federal column in front of Petersburg was moving toward the Weldon Railroad. Having no reserves outside the trenches, Beauregard asked reinforcements. Subsequently, he sent a reassuring message that the column appeared to be small and that he had sent some infantry to support General Deering's cavalry, who were opposing the enemy's advance. Lee, however, did not relish the prospect of having only one brigade of cavalry on the right of the Petersburg sector and he ordered Rooney Lee to proceed to the south side at once. By the morning of the 19th it developed that at least three divisions of Federal infantry were on the Weldon Railroad, in the vicinity of Globe Tavern, three and a half miles south of the Confederate right at Petersburg. Beauregard stated that he was moving out against these troops with four brigades of infantry and with the cavalry that Lee was sending. Although he telegraphed, result would be more certain with a stronger force of infantry, he did not renew his appeal for reinforcements. Later in the day of the 19th indications pointed to a return to the south side of part of the troops that had been operating on Field's front. That same afternoon, a P. Hill struck the enemy's column near Globe Tavern and captured 2,700 prisoners. Lee did not gamble on this advantage. In order that Beauregard might have sufficient troops for his offensive, Lee quickly dispatched to the Petersburg sector all the infantry that had been sent to Field's relief. The Federals, however, kept their grip on the Weldon Railroad and could not be dislodged with the force that Beauregard had employed. If the battle was to be renewed, it was plain that still more troops had to be used. Lee urged this on Beauregard. On the morning of the 21st he ordered Hampton to move his division south of the Appomattox and after a time he directed Field to send two of his brigades if the enemy had reduced force north of the James. He decided, also, to go to Petersburg and to see for himself the situation on the Weldon Railroad. He arrived on an excessively hot afternoon, in time to witness a gallant but futile attack by Mahone in front of Globe Tavern. During the course of this fight, through misunderstanding on the part of Hill and Mahone, General Haygood threw his brigade into a re-entrant in the Federal lines and had to lead back the survivors under a heavy fire. Mahone reconnoitered again and told Lee that if he were given two more brigades he would guarantee to drive the Federals from the railroad. Lee assented and sent for the reinforcements, but when they failed to arrive in time he concluded that the enemy had too firm a hold on the railroad to be shaken. The contingency Lee had anticipated from the time he took up the Petersburg line was at hand, the northern end of the Weldon Railroad from Rowanty Creek to Petersburg was definitely lost. The defense of the capital and the subsistence of the Army of Northern Virginia had now to depend on the full employment of the South Side and of the Richmond and Danville railroads. There were murmurings in Richmond that the Weldon Line need not have been lost if Beauregard had met the first advance with a larger column, but Lee knew both the limitations under which Beauregard fought and the inevitability of the capture of the road by the enemy. With the simple assertion that the smallness of the attacking force prevented it from dislodging the foe, he devoted himself to making the most of the lines of supply left him.
the loss of the Weldon Railroad came, unfortunately, at a time when there was no corn either in Richmond or at the army depots around Petersburg. Lee at once set wagon trains to hauling supplies over the 20 miles of road that lay between Petersburg and Stony Creek, which was on the Weldon Railroad line below the point where it had been torn up by the Federals. He believed that by the diligent use of these trains, and of the remaining railroads, with perhaps some importation of grain by way of Wilmington, it would be possible to subsist the army until the Virginia corn crop was harvested. In a wider view, with an eye to the presidential campaign in the North, where McClellan was opposing Lincoln, Lee believed that failure of the Federals to drive the Confederates from Petersburg, after so much sacrifice, would have a dispiriting effect on the people of the United States. Seddon, seeing the immediate problem and knowing more of politics, was not optimistic. He felt acute concern because Lee's army and that of Hood were now drawing corn from the same territory. For days after Lee decided to abandon the effort to recover the Weldon Railroad, there came a dramatic epilogue. With Rooney Lee's division and his own, now under M. C. Butler of South Carolina, General Hampton was operating west of the railway and in front of the Confederate right. A reconnaissance in force toward Reams Station, some four and a half miles south of Globe Tavern, showed Hampton that the Federals were tearing up the railroad near that point. He found that they were not well placed and he asked the assistance of the infantry in making an attack. It was desirable, of course, that the enemy should not be left free to destroy the railroad indefinitely to the southward, for this would increase the distance between Petersburg and that part of the railroad still in southern hands. In the political situation, also, every defeat would tend to discredit the war party in the north. With these considerations in mind Lee read Hampton's proposal sympathetically and decided to adopt it. But the mistake of attacking with insufficient force was not to be repeated. Two brigades of Haight's division, two of Mahone's, and three of Wilcox's were ordered to move for Reams Station, Hampton's old division of cavalry and Rooney Lee's were both to be employed. Besides the two brigades that Field had been ordered to bring to Petersburg, it would appear that he was now directed to send a third. On the afternoon of August 24, the infantry brigades were quietly moved beyond the right of the Confederate trenches and were marched by roads that led toward Reams Station from the west. The next morning, with Hampton clearing the way, they advanced eastward through a wooded country. They found Hancock's two corps in front of some feeble works at Reams Station, entirely separated from the V Corps of Warren, which was farther up the railroad. An assault during the early afternoon by two of the brigades under Wilcox was repulsed. After a brief delay, part of his division and some of Haight's troops attacked farther to the left. They were brilliantly supported by Pegram's artillery and quickly stormed the right of the Federal lines. Simultaneously, Hampton worked his way around to the Federal left and, dismounting his men, threw them against the enemy. The victory was immediate and decisive, for the raw recruits in Hancock's corps behaved badly. Some 2,000 of them were captured, along with nine guns, and the attempt of the Federals to destroy more of the railroad was abandoned. The Confederate infantry brought off their wounded, buried their dead, and returned the same night to Petersburg. Like almost every other Confederate reverse during the investment of Petersburg, the loss of the Weldon raid had its origin in the disparity of forces with which Lee had to defend so long a line. His diminished army was not strong enough to meet quickly all the blows that Grant could deliver by shifting his attack from one side of the James to the other. Then, too, Grant's strategy was far better than it had been at any stage of the operations since he had taken command in the East. His drive against Field on August 1416 had not been, as Lee thought, a major attempt to seize Richmond, but had been intended primarily to destroy the Virginia Central Railroad and in that way to prevent the dispatch of reinforcements to Early. As the attack on the north side had developed, Grant's strategy had changed somewhat. He had initiated the advance to Lee's right merely as a flank movement that might afford him an opening for an attack in the vicinity of the lead works, and he had not considered that Lee had reduced his force sufficiently to justify any large-scale operation in that quarter. The thrust at the Weldon Railroad had been almost an afterthought and had been undertaken by Grant as a reconnaissance in force, though with the ultimate object of compelling Lee to recall troops from early so that Sheridan might strike a blow. Throughout the attacks of August, Lee moved his troops skillfully from right to left, with the soundest judgment and the greatest promptness, but Grant was be lucky and successful, not precisely in the manner he had hoped, but probably in a larger measure than he expected.
His operation on the north side did not reach the Virginia Central Railroad, but it spelled the doom of Early because it forced Lee to bring back Hampton, then on his way to oppose Sheridan. The move to the Weldon Railroad was very costly in life and it did not compel Lee to summon immediately to Petersburg any part of Early's infantry, but it did place Grant where he could farther extend his left and bring the Confederate line one notch nearer the strangulation of a formal siege. The fortunes of war, which in this case were but another name for numerical inferiority, were running strongly against Lee. He saw plainly that Grant's operations were designed to starve him out, and for this last, dreadful struggle he prepared himself as best he could with his ever-dwindling resources.